Okay, so hello and welcome to the first session of the new center seminar, What Now? Contemporary Art and the Post-Pandemic Conditions. Um, i just read the description real quickly in our bios as usual. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is altering many aspects of not only our lives, but also our perception of the world, uh, reshaping the individual and collective minds in still unmapped ways. Hard isolation during the lockdowns gave us a taste for schizophrenia. The modulation of routine in an infinite loop, normalized silence, exhaustion, insomnia, and even subtle hallucinations. If uh, all of humanity's problems stem from man, man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone, as Pascal once wrote, uh, COVID-19 demanded that, we, that humanity struggles with the center of this supposed existential disquiet. Um, at the same time, the, the pandemic abolished public spaces, providing only enclosed bubbles and transmission cables between them. Uh, private spaces were invaded by the public consciousness that crossed the membrane of our digital screens and speakers. Uh, overall, home turned into a bunker inside of which we needed to act upon the world with radical repercussions for our mental states. Habits and course became rituals. Contemplation was mandatory and drugs uh, prescribed or recreational, provided synthetic enhancements or suspensions of experience. Uh, there to exist in a state of complete atomization, we learn to become tact agnostics and self-hypnotists, uh, applying whatever form of technology at our disposal to gain traction on our cognition and experience of our body in time. Um, Mo, are you? You're muted, Mo. Yeah. yeah. In the smaller but no less consequential world of contemporary art, not only were value grids and the networks of production and distribution impacted by the pandemic, but, the, but new conceptual challenges were pressed against a fragile ecosystem already under economic, ideological, and philosophical pressures for meaningful transformation. The material costs of a rush transition to online environments and the political barriers implied by the new normal are just some of the conflicts with which the art world has been forced to grapple. And while blockchain is a promising technology to help artists in the near future, the NFT market is already drying up and the main question still remains. How will art and aesthetics adapt to the profound shifts in political economy and perception brought on by the pandemic? And how will the art world keep pace with these shifts? This survey seminar will bring together artists, curators, academic galleries, cultural agents, and technology experts to debate the future of the art world in light of the sweeping changes brought on by the pandemic. We will map the future condition and expectations and figure out what the contemporary art of the future requires from us in the post-pandemic global landscape. Yeah, so just read, uh, present yourselves. Um... Um, uh, Mohamed Salami is an independent Berlin-based artist, uh, created in critic and curator from Canada. He holds a BFA from Emily Carr University and an MA in Critical Curatorial Studies from the University of British Columbia. Uh, he has shown his works in Ashkal Awan's Homework 7, With the Weave and Robot Love. Uh, his writings have been published in Eflux, Flash Art, Third Rail, Brooklyn Rail, Ocula, Arts from the Working Class, and Spike. Um, Salami's curatorial experiment for machine use only was included in the 11th edition of Guangzhou Biennale. Uh, together with a, a changing cast, he forms the artist collective Alphabet Collection. Uh, Salami is, of course, the organizer of the new center for research and practice, and he has been the confounding organizer of the new center since 2014. Yeah, and just to add a little bit to that, I'm very excited. And a proposal of mine was picked up by the VAC Foundation in Moscow. I'm going to be making a new commission. It's kind of like the most closest artwork to my heart that I'll be producing in 2022 for an exhibition on uh, personal subjectivity and history, which deals with cinema and Iranian revolution. So I'll be working on that. Nima, it's like we should talk about this. Yeah, and, and it's like a really great show and a really great opportunity to kind of like revisit the links between Iranian revolution and cinema. And I just published a review of the Moving Image Biennale at, uh, in Geneva with Ocula, which is like the latest example of my writing. In fact, I met Nicholas right after coming from Geneva. I stopped in Rome and I had just seen the show. So if you want to like see my 
recent writing, just search for search for it on my wall. And I posted it the other day. It just came out on January 5th. I'm gonna tell you about Romola. Romola Moraes is a Brazilian writer, sound artist, and ethnographer. He's a PhD candidate in music at the City University of New York with, with a Fulbright scholarship, which is, as you know, very important. He, he got this, they only offer that for maybe two or three people in South America every year. He holds a master in culture and communication from ECHO UFRJ and a certificate in transdisciplinary studies from the New Center for Research and Practice. He is also our own editor of the Triple Amperson Journal and the author of Casulos, uh, publisher co in 2019. And currently he's researching phenomenologies of imagination, post-mediatic maximalism, the entwinement of pop and experimental and the cosmopoetics of crate, crate digging. That's yeah, yeah. So now if you'd like everyone to kind of like present yourselves, actually, uh, let's talk like, about the format a little bit first, right, Mo? Uh, that yeah, you're I already explaining. Yeah. I mean, I did it before the recording stuff, but maybe you can summarize that a little bit in, for the, for those who weren't here when we were talking and the fact that it's not on the video. Yeah, we kind of decided, like, usually the service seminars is one guest per session, and it's kind of like presenting the work or the research of that guest. Uh, but we decided to do something different. We wanted to create this kind of friction in the seminar and kind of create debate and involve you guys more into the discussion and kind of like have you guys participate in it and kind of like create this new format of like pedagogy in which just kind of this mixture of like podcast with debate and like class and like involve everyone and kind of like, because we want to like kind of brainstorm what's the situation right now, because we don't think there's like a definite like kind of answer yet. It's just like, this is a really fresh thing. And we want you guys to participate too and we want to create this sort of like, um, conflicts between our guests. So we are inviting two guests per session. We kind of have a, already some teams sketched out. We just missing the last uh, session right now, which, which we are to confirm one last guest. Um, but I mean, I think it's pretty exciting. And as Mo said, everyone is doing it as right now. I mean, the last edition of Reflux is basically just this dialogue, dialogical thing, uh, like essays in the format of dialogue and um, and even reviews like art, art reviews, you know, exhibition reviews. Um, yeah, so the form is kind of different when you try to experiment with it. And since the beginning, even like our own instructing is like, it's two people, we're kind of like, we don't agree on everything. So it might generate some friction, some interesting friction, right? Yeah, so today, today, today also we're not going to do two separate presentations. We're going to like try to do what we will be expecting our guests to do. Yeah. Um, Oh, but before, so, before you before you go on, I just want to say that uh, I'm very honored to be working with Romola. He's a brilliant young scholar. We've worked on several projects together already. We we are we are we are writing together a lot. Sometimes he doesn't want his name mentioned, so he just shadow writes for me. Sometimes he actually write we write together and we kind of like co co write together. And Romola has been central in ensuring that our postgraduate program with, uh, with ESAP is going to take place, which will invite all of you to take a look at it and apply. It's a really great way to kind of like turn- Actually, it has just been approved, right? Uh, yeah, just, just approved. approved. That's what I'm talking about. It. Our, postgraduate, yeah. our, post, our, our postgraduate program was just approved by the Ministry of Education in, in Portugal. And yeah, I mean, it's going to be in English. It's not going to be in Portuguese, but yeah, but it's great. And and he's been central in doing all the required translation and working both with ESAP and with administrators in 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 the ministry to kind of ensure that new centers sort of like moving to the next level. So it's really like I'm really lucky to be working with him, you know. Yeah. So no, just, most very you know, kind of and you <laughs> jumped into it and you 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 didn't let me let me say that in a proper moment. But yeah. Okay. That was very kind. And I think it's just a testament to like the opportunities that the new sensor can afford you guys. If you like. yeah, but, but also, I don't want to make you sound like a, like a genius because we've also had other other students who, who basically came up with amazing seminars and immediately taught. So so please, please, if if like later on in your second year of study, if you if you have ideas for teaching, we would be totally happy to see what it is and sort of like like there will be no distinction between somebody who has new ideas and want to teach. You know, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a student, it's, it's very, very much the same. Or not the same, but in the same spectrum. 
Yeah. So let's present yourselves, uh, guys. Uh, and we wanted to do something different. So like, we don't want you guys to just present and say, uh, like, oh, oh, I'm that person. I'm come from this place. So uh, we actually are asking you guys to say what's the most memorable kind of artistic experience that you had that's like related to the pandemic. And this can be even like a record, like pop music or like sculpture or like an exhibition or even like a, an experience or something like that. Something that, uh, that has been remarkable for you guys. So like name, where you based because like we have people from all over the world here so that's important for us um and what's like one memorable thing that maybe like represents your taste a little bit and your sensibility and that maybe is related to how you think of the pandemic and the pandemic situation so it could be an art exhibition one artwork uh a record a movie uh or any kind of like intentionally produced experience you know so like i don't know like a performance poetry reading, something that happened after the pandemic. That's also a clue for other people to kind of understand what kind of sensibilities you have, much more than like you explaining your career or all those like things of like, what your research is interested in and all that. So- Yeah, because I feel like taste, taste is way more important than like your CV, right? So like try to, I don't know, maybe show a little bit of your taste of who you are. So, so You know, because everybody sees a different list of names. Maybe you want to call people out and actually, why don't you start with your own? And then I say the next, and then we go maybe to the next person. Me? Myself? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I maybe this, this is like an easy answer, but the Donda concerts, I suppose, uh, were remarkable for me. This is, of... You stole it from me, man. I was no, going to say Donda. No, that's, no, the, but that's okay. That's, that's the easiest. That's the easiest. You were talking about, you were talking about the, the third listening party in Chicago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, like, like that great with show. The like, like yeah, with the fire? Yeah, with the fire. Like, Kind of like Wagnerian kind of show, like kind of. I think that's you can talk about that. I ha I have a second one, so I'm not gonna like repeat that because really, my my best album of the year has been Donda, and it's like I've listened to it nonstop. The only thing I've listened to is Donda since it came out. Seriously, but that's just like my personal taste. But what I really, really was fascinated with were two things. I'm gonna talk about two things. One is the TV series Succession. Just like those of you who have seen it. <laughs> it's pretty and good succession and then the second thing is no but but nick for the wrong youth for the for the wrong reasons you know what i mean not like succession and uh the second thing is the the, the new the new get back movie that came out and i found it fascinating because Beatles were doing reality TV Kardashian show in the late 60s, early 70s. Like they were yes. totally operating in the in the mindset of reality TV and they could afford to just let the 35 millimeter film roll. And also they were time capsuling it. Like they were completely wanting to author an image of themselves for the young people of today by locking up all this footage and then working on it like many decades later to kind of like, so it's like a really future looking project, you know, and when you look at it, it looks very fresh and incredible. Like, like this band from the 60s really was obsessed about how people decades later will view them or how young people a few decades later will view them and kind of worked on producing this like, doc. it's no documentary, it's totally- it's scripted, right? Yeah, it's scripted. Yeah. It's totally <laughs> yeah. like Kardashians. It's totally like yeah. a lot of reality TV, right? And yeah, and they were already working in this like in this sort of new media paradigm way ahead of everybody else. And again, it's not about like the music is incredible, which it is, or cinematography is great, which it is, or like composition and colors are great, but I really think it's a great artwork because of that. So go ahead. So next one in my list here is Nima, I guess. Nima Bariman. I wish I was the last one. It's a tough question okay. to answer. Uh, <laughs> we can skip you maybe if you don't all right to, if you want to, yeah. yeah no but he had time to think about it we both yeah. like took long so he had time <laughs> so should i say absolutely all right so my name is nima and i'm from iran live in boulder colorado and so i, I don't want to talk about like my project but the things that happened during the pandemic was that it's, it's very personal and also it's very kind of not very personal because I met a person here that we shaped our collective S3026 and all happened because of the pandemic. I don't want to talk about my taste because I just want to <laughs> detour from your question to something. <laughs> and um, 
so this uh, this S3026 uh, collective, the, the reason that it's shaped was that we noticed that everything is moving online. So we started a, a gallery space uh, that each week we switched the show. And because we didn't want that the people lose the physical experience of observing artworks. So every week we just switch, switch the shows to different shows. And then by this S3026, we moved on and we had 32 shows so far. And then we started to think about creating an events and applying for a scholarship and funds to organize an events for free for other peoples, like by inviting other scholars and practitioners. Mm -hmm. So just having a free events for other people who cannot afford or just like not how like how academia po policing the, the intellectual property or like other people's. So, but invite other people from outside of academia to academia and prepare this for free for them. And then uh, uh, one of the result is like inviting Razani Garisani and for the next semester, we are looking to, to invite other people and we are in conversation with them. But just creating this free environment, like free labor and uh, so, and also during the pandemic, I watched so many serial killers, series and psychopaths. I don't know why, but I, I mean, really that like. counts. That's pretty but good. It's like, I, I, I watched all of these like on HBO and all these like investigation discovery, all these series. So I'm very pro in like serial killer. So you did <laughs> talk about your place. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now Nick, Nick vocalized. Oh. Um, hi, I'm not based anywhere. Uh, I'm about to leave Rome tomorrow and then I go to Perugia and then I go to Turin and then I go to Zurich. Um, so I'm based in precarity. Um, I, is it something that happened like, are we saying like post, like in, in the past year or like since the pandemic kind of like began? Since the pandemic. Um, I mean, the first thing that keeps like coming into my mind uh, is actually something that I kind of worked on and produced. Uh, I've, it's been quite intense in Italy where I've been based for probably the past year and a half. Um, where I haven't really been able to see anything or do anything, we, you know, strict lockdown for at least eight months. Um, and so my partner and I kind of reacted to that with a uh, collaboration he has with a space in Zurich called Sharhale. Um, we're all also kind of tangentially working, but we produced a kind of virtual green room kind of incubator where we just got to spend a month talking with artists and kind of showing their process online. And it's just been the way of kind of maintaining a community when I'm not necessarily based anywhere or not able to really see anyone or talk to anyone. So it's actually been really special to be involved in so many artworks in such a like incredibly intimate way. Um, and so through that, I would say like multiple artist projects. But I guess like if I were to pick something that I haven't worked on, it would probably be um, I would say Autumn Nights work at the kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. Her her show was canceled, and so she did this series of videos that um, were exploring the space. And it's something that I can just like sit and drool over for hours and hours. But it was canceled because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the venue was changed back to the original location, and like it was like a post-apocalyptic because like there was still an apple like half eaten on the director's desk and you know she got to play with everything so I thought that was really special that's pretty good that's pretty good I see you are all like mentioning your own stuff your cheaters your little devil yeah but that's good that's good you gotta love your own stuff I mean you gotta like um, I, I'm against the humility stuff you gotta like think that you're the stuff you're, that you're doing is the best thing ever um next is Rodolfo Ortega Hi, how are you? Uh, well, I, uh, I was um, running to see what I've been watching on. <laughs> uh, I think that, well, I'm Rodolfo Sousa. Uh, I am, uh, I'm from Mexico and I live in the um, uh, province of Mexico. I don't live in, in Mexico City. I'm not that 
accelerationist. So I like uh, I like the green of uh, and I think that what I've been watching um, or what uh, what took my attention is uh, Grey's Anatomy seasons where they took the pandemics into you know as part of the narrative i mean like half of the of the last season oh, oh we have a, an intermission yeah <laughs> all right keep going keep going yeah uh, half of the half of the last season season uh, gray is all time in coma coma having visions and then it, it took place that you know like the dead characters of the series reappear in the dreams or visions of gray so i i don't know i found that like amazing that that uh, speed they were able to create a narrative on a on a on a problem and then um in the other side you know um i think that um and maybe do, cheating a little and, and thinking on the Get Back documentary that uh, Mohammed was talking. I was thinking about the documentary made about Velvet Underground that mm. is, ama is amazing. And it, it also remind me, reminds me a lot of, the, of these documentaries uh, made by the friend, this, uh, you know, Chris, uh, Chris Marker. You know, that's everything, it's images appearing uh, in, you know, still images. I think that the documentary is a little bit like that and uh, takes some, uh, a place, uh, you know, a strange place on, on nostalgia and the nostalgia for the, for, uh, uh, you know, New York City that doesn't exist anymore also, I think, yeah. That's pretty good, that's pretty good. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, next one here in my list is Igor Anario. Hi everyone. <laughs> so uh, I'm Igor. I'm I'm based in Brazil, and uh, I don't I, I don't remember quite well what was the movies that I watched. Since uh, I don't know there, there was some collapse of memory recently, and uh, perhaps what I remember I remember some director that I me and Zenobia watched some uh, I don't know five movies, and we matched his productions with one kind of drink that is Cuba Libre. Uh, drink with rum and Coca Cola, so we 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 passed to to uh, to to manage this reality in the moves of Wong Kawai, Wong Kawai, yes, yes, and so uh, I think that was the most watched in this this pandemic situation. But I would like to to uh, to share with you, uh, uh, um, I, re uh, I don't know how to say that, but perhaps. It's not a kind of statement, but it's something like that about the performance that I, video performance that I did last year, and and the it I will read uh, is a short text. Uh, before the pandemic confinement, I used to walk every day from home to the arts department. The journey used to be short, about 1.5 kilometers, lasting around 15 and 25 minutes. On hot days, like most of them, the time would spend because when it's very hot we get very slow i don't know how, how, how to explain that but 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 also this will also happen in rainy days because puddles added a greater obstacles i remember the imaginary drawings i used to draw as i circled the puddles a kind of antagonistic safe navigation which unlike a sea voyage around an island or an island or a continent was by way of a firm territory i skirted the water with that in mind, for the video performance, I decided to mirror the temporal and spatial duration of their walk from home to the arts department, um, whose journey was undertaken in a corridor here in my house of five meters and 14 centimeters and resembles small hyphens, a path made of fragments that could compose any path, each coming and going I performed in the corridor, counted as a spatial turn among the 140 needed to reach 1.5 kilometer. It, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit schizophrenic, but I would, <laughs> but I would like to, to share. 
yeah. that's good yeah like uh we were try, uh, thinking of mentioning sometimes like uh, an experience is also valid like I, I don't know maybe you took a drug and it was interesting in, the, in terms of like your relation to the pandemic and I, I like that you like mixed the Cuba Libre stuff with the with the experience of watching the movie I think like when you are doing a critical review of something you can throw everything in like if you are like if you have a headache that impacts the way you see the work right so you you should mention that like oh i had a headache when i was in at, at this exhibition so because that uh, that like implies something to your critical thing you know i don't know if mo, mo agrees with me but i think your experience as a critic must encompass everything that's happening even like if you drank something before a movie that's of course that's relevant right to the experience um so next one in the list here is Paige emery hi i'm Paige based in LA. And I think I misheard the question if it was supposed to be something from our personal, um, like a personal project or just something we experienced or, or just either. More like an experience, but I think people are mentioning that personal project because it's something that was remarkable to them, like as an experience Maybe. itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I might just say personal because um, project because that's what I <laughs> thought the question was, but both as experience. Um, definitely from the pandemic, I was honing in a lot on um, certain types of rituals that would be really sustainable for coping with just the situation that we've been in. And that um, ended up taking a lot of forms in um, artistic expression and um, I, and through different mediums of how it could be like infrastructure for meaning making practices. But I, with that experience, it was really interesting of like how that relates on like a collective level um, when it like gets turned into this like infrastructural format, I guess, and um, and how much I think I was seeing a lot during the pandemic as well. Um, the like the importance of like focusing on on real like daily practices um, was really helpful for uh, yeah, just for like coping with all the craziness and uncertainties of everything. So. It was good. That, 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 that counts. Um, next is Veronika Hanakova. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Veronika and I'm based in Prague, uh, Czech Republic. And I think one of my most memorable experience from the pandemic uh, happened during the first wave of COVID because I sort of participate in screening of uh, Zia Anger, my first film, which is um, like internet sort of uh, performance and exhibition of her first film but you as viewer uh, you are also connected to this um sort of screening because you have to react to text from her and you have to reply to messages and you're sort of connecting you are not really passive but also you have to be active if you want to so i found it was fun i'm not a big fan of the film on part of the content but i'm a big fan of the film as a form but also the pandemic was for me Phil and has been for me sort of synonym uh, with nostalgia. So I'm listening to DJ Sabrina, the teenage DJ, because it's nostalgia for 90s and Sabrina, the teenage uh, witch. So yeah, these are my two things that I'm doing. I'm mostly listening to DJ Sabrina. And also she, uh, she has lovely like Instagram full of memes if you would like to check that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, next is Catherine Adams. Hi, um, I'm Catherine. I'm, I'm based in New York. Um, yeah, I was thinking of a few things that I experienced during the pandemic. I was um, focusing, I guess, a lot on performance and kind of trying to track how performers were continuing their work through like virtual formats. One thing that was really memorable was a performance I had seen where like um, there was trying to create an effect of contact through like adjacencies of screens and through like certain sight lines within the filming. And this was like in the first wave of COVID where, you know, um, there was so much ambiguity around like messaging about um, how to deal with it. And people were sort of hyper cautious and there was a lot of emphasis on social distancing and so on. So contact wasn't, was often kind of um, impossible or it was, um, like uh, regulations didn't allow it. So yeah, I was kind of looking at how um, uh, performers and particularly dancers were kind of using like new media to achieve effects in this kind of synesthetic way. Um, 
Yeah, and then there's a couple of other things I'd seen. One was a series through Issue Project Room called Isolated Field Series. I don't know if anyone saw this, but um, it was like a series of kind of sound and like multimedia works that were styled as field recordings. And it was, I think, sometimes using similar like strategies as I had seen in the performance work, like this kind of montage um, like way of uh, creating um, effects of like liveness that, that couldn't really be like, so, yeah, those are a couple of things. <laughs> All right, that's great. I like how people are dividing like the experience of the first wave, second wave, third wave, and it's three different like, like uh, perception, perceptive experiences. Pretty good. Um, next is Agatha Simonek. Simonek? Uh, sorry for pronouncing it. Uh, Simonek. Uh, hi, I'm Agatha. I'm based in uh, Poland, and I would like to share uh, with the recent experience, uh, uh, but it gave me two feelings that I also had during the pandemic. I was participating in the conference uh, organized by National Gallery uh, in Warsaw. Uh, the conference was dedicated to art and education. And um, my first feeling, it was this um, sense of solidarity where artists are making uh, little scale projects with friends. They are making collaborative exhibitions together. They are looking for their own uh, resource, resources. And um, the, the feel of the so solidarity and collab like collaboration was very strong uh, when we discussed all those art projects. And um, the other feeling, it was, um, going towards the changing politics in Poland and the political situation because the National Gallery was um, uh, changed. Uh, the uh, the dire director of the gallery was changed say, in December. Uh, he starts a new cadency actually from, from the 1st January. And um, this is actually now in Poland, this is this, a strong feeling that uh, government is taking over all main institutions and uh, the new director, uh, Janusz Jankowski, uh, I don't know, this, this is the guy who paints his self portraits and also portraits of Jesus, Jesus and um, um, uh, other religious representations. So, um, so yeah, like it. So the the feeling that this national gallery who, that uh, organized the conference uh, is falling down, and uh, uh, and they will not have more um, interesting projects and initiatives was very depressing, and uh, uh, so it's kind of mixture of feelings, the solidarity and we are uh, doing something together and this uh, political situation that is what I was struggling with during the pandemic. Okay. <laughs> that's good, that's good. That's great, I think. Uh, that, I, was I a big, that was a big story in the, the art world, international art world and created a lot of like pros for like people who are protesting the appointment. And I have a lot of Polish friends in Berlin who are very involved in sort of like uh, making this more international and bringing more attention to it. And, and of course, your most like remarkable experience of a pandemic might be like a political event or like the closing of a museum or something like that, you know, of course. Um, next is Zenobio Hamuzniat. Hi, I'm, I'm based from, from Brazil as well. And yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about the, the uh, uh, memorable, memorable kind of uh, aesthetic experience. And in, in the beginning, it was very hard to, to, to have these kind of things because we were very, very close here. And also the, the art institutions are still close. And also the, the universities and, and so on and the, the culture thing. But uh, I had, we, we had the opportunity uh, actually uh, to have here at our at our place at home to have uh, uh, to open our, our place to to uh, 
a, a film team uh, to make a, a, a short movie here. And it was, a, it was a very, very good experience to, to see everybody's work as a, it was almost actually kind of a performance. And to, to see the film like behind, you know, from, from, from the cameras and also from, from our place, from, from home, because they, they change all the, the you know, the, the, the set, they, they, they made uh, different kind of things and we were actually at another place, but, and, and talking to, 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 to the people and, and see the, the, them work, uh, their work was, was, yeah, was, was very good. All right. Uh, next in my list is Alberto, Alberto Morello. Is that right? Alberto Morello. Yeah, that's right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alberto. I live originally from um, Venezuela. Um, I live and based in Berlin. Um, I'm currently in Madrid with really bad connection, but I think everything is fine. Oh, so you're, you, you're also in Berlin or Dresden? I didn't yeah. hear. Yeah, I mean, I'm based in Berlin. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I was trying to think about all, like what has been kind of defining or kind of an experience defining during these years. I think um, pers personally, I did one thing, which was um, I'm, I mean, I'm working in, in a gallery mainly. So there was a time of like everything just being suspended and canceled. So I wrote a series of proposals or like exhibitions that I wanted to do under the heading of cancellations. And so I may I just, ask what, what gallery you're affiliated with? Kali Yeah. And so, yeah, so I'm here working now also in space here in Madrid. Um, then I, yeah, there was a series of ideas of, kind of trying to understand how to cancel myself. And I think in a weird self-fulfilling prophecy, I just kind of stopped doing work. So um, for myself, and just kind of really embedded myself into, into work. Um, and then the experience of working as a, like an art producer for me was kind of very extenuating and exhausting. And, and I really dreaded work. <laughs> During the next during the pandemic, actually, one of the best things for me was to, to have joined um, the new center and the seminars during this time and having this kind of companionship. And I remember, for, like, really thinking about mental health and like how difficult it is to actually have these type of resources in the art world, right? And I remember I, there was the seminar by um, Una Chun Coemergence that for me was just like healing at the time. Um, it was such a wonderful seminar. Um, and then, yeah, so I think the experience of, um, of this tediousness, dread, dreadfulness that has been a compen com you know, with us during the entire pandemic is kind of this general feeling that I want to share here. Um, that's great. Yeah. That's very lovely, actually. Um, that's great to hear. And and uh, yeah, some people are, the experience of some people has been just dreadful. Like, I mean, I have a friend who's like he decided to stop doing anything else besides work because he thought like it's not really worth it to do right now. Like maybe I'll postpone it a little bit. And then like it's been two years, and then he's the enough, and you know, this 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 full of regret. Um, and it's easy to get caught up in this sort of loops uh, when you're inside of like lockdown or in the pandemic or in this sort of situation. It's hard to get off of these loops. Um, so these places like the new center, I think, really act as this sort of like way out, right? Which is uh, pretty good. And I was trying to like brag about it, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, next is I think Akshat Kare. I'm not. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Akshat. No, that was actually like a close enough pronunciation. So um, I'm going to apologize beforehand uh, if like I take a little bit more time. So um, I'm going to talk uh, both about my experience and uh, the projects that I've been working on. 
so um for me it's very easy to get caught up in like virtual circles or like bubbles that like separate me from the ground reality of like my own country so i uh, i'm from india and um like i live in new delhi and i've been involved in like the internet philosophy groups for, uh, from like early 2015 and um a lot of the interaction that i ha- i've had over the last like say 7 years is with people who are like decidedly from the first world so when the pandemic first happened what happened with me was i instead of like uh, getting a daily dose of um the smells and the like visceral reality of my own country i was like further thrust into this bubble like even this particular space right now this seminar is itself a bubble so uh, my first uh, visceral experience of being reinserted into my own country was when um, like my fa- my family has a very struggling like waterproofing business a very small uh, struggling business that like uh my mom and like i have been looking after ever since like my dad died um 5 years ago now so um i was like one of the first people who had to go to work when the like even like while the lockdowns were like the first like ease uh that was like given on the lockdowns i was like one of the people on the streets so my first like very visceral experience was um watching um a little boy beg and like if you know anything about india that is not something that you should be surprised by because that is like a very like it's there every day it's like um little kids are begging little kids are like performing certain tricks and like you can see these repetitions um with what they're selling or the way they are begging so that you can like see that it is like institutionalized at some level like it's it's planned um but like this boy who was like uh, coming to beg while we were sh- uh, like we had returned from work and like had stopped by in order to get sanitizers and everything the hesitancy um on his face his general like demeanor and his clothing immediately suggested to me and my mother that this boy had never begged before in his life or at least for him this was a very recent experience so i think that was the first thing that was like that like where where the hell am i am i like in this cloistered um bubble that i would like to live into which is like my own apartment and my own life or like if i just fucking step out on the street sorry for the abuses if i step out on the street what uh, what my reality actually is so because i've like uh, my family works in construction i'm like very close to um the laborers and i can see how work is done and what their material reality has been throughout the pandemic which has been <sighs> extremely bad and um like especially in india uh, unwaged laborers or unskilled laborers as they are called although particularly i think the work that they do is anything but unskilled so the way they manage the way they live the way um they've had to walk thousands of kilometers india is a big country in order to get to their homes when like all transportation was shut off this in contrast with um virtual spaces where like first world people are complaining about xyz restrictions and uh philosophizing or thinking of critical theory or thinking of art spaces so for me my first um because like i am a novelist and a poet so my first um thought was about the impotence of art artists and specifically my own medium fiction uh the impotence of these mediums to affect any immediate and important change and like how uh, you're someone right who's an <laughs> uh and someone who's like um organizing on the ground is actually like maybe contributing a lot more 
um than i ever could at least or maybe like i could contribute something but not in the short term so maybe in the long term over like 10 years maybe my contributions would match his or hers or theirs so that was like an anxiety for me going into this so over time like my first like experience with my own projects was to create very post modern conceptual kind of art because like i rely on the real world for my writing so i have to walk about see things experience things in order to like write about it so i ended up doing like conceptual visual poetry or like erasures and everything but then eventually then i shifted into like and i did like this big novel last year and in it like i categorize things into like four different spaces the space of the virtual the space of the dream the space of the symbolic and the space of the real borrowing a little from lacan but like not using the word imaginary like very intentionally in order for it to not be a one to one uh similarity because like i wanted to explore this tension that like uh people in the third world have where the internet has enabled them to interact with and get um ideas from the first world and like have these things in their life but they immediately like the moment they leave that bubble and enter their own real world something else entirely something uh which is at odds with that space of the virtual is like existing there so i guess that is what i did i'm sorry for taking so much time no that's okay because the experience you're explaining is very different than everybody else and i think it was important for you to to finish saying what you were saying even though you took to took some time that's totally i think it's fine i hope it was fine for everyone because it brought a perspective that kind of like is missing Yeah, no, I think it's be- beautiful and, and sad, of course. But and that's one of the points, I guess, for this seminar is that like people are li- uh, doing the pandemic in various stratified uh, levels and uh, different like social uh, backgrounds, and also in one person is experiencing different social uh, stratifications of a pandemic. So it's different levels, different like um, scales of a pandemic, right? So the internet thing and, the, and going outside in the street, there's two different scales that you have to deal with, and kind of like. Your 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 microphone's kind of uh, muffed, Mom. I think I don't know if it's just it, me. But... Is it muffed? Like you don't hear me? No, I, I hear, but it's kind of like a there's this risk. Yeah, because it's these headphones. I'm not using the laptop because I thought I'm improving it. So, but I guess I'm not improving it. But what I was going right. to say is is Ashad. Actually, this the idea of this seminar began for both me and Romola in the middle of summer 2020, where we had a. Uh, one of our pub, online public sessions called Sheltering Places, in which the artist Hayam Sharifi of the Slavs and Tatar Collective basically bluntly said, well, maybe art is no longer part of the zeitgeist. So that's, that's what the pandemic did. Art basically is no longer able to kind of like be, be part of this, like part of what, what responds, like properly responds to the time. represent the time and maybe the, the time of the art is over and that's when i thought oh my god we got to like hold on to this sentence and do something about it and as you know like pandemic provided an opportunity for like a lot of institutional artists to kind of like oh my god new function for art oh art going to respond to this like responding to the moment right and mm-hmm. and your reaction is actually very like counterintuitive and say actually maybe art unable to respond maybe actually this is like a moment where like art actually can't play a role at least in the short term like you said right so yeah so that's why i interjected and said you're in the right seminar because i think these questions will come up in different sessions and we will challenge a lot of our guests to kind of like respond to this so yeah but but because we have few more people and we didn't really think this is going to take this long actually but, yeah, but uh, i think i think we have just two people and then the other are kind of like are not i don't know if they are here but let, let's try to do a little bit more quickly if we can guys yes uh, so next is georgiana kojo karu sorry Hey, uh, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Georgiana. I'm from Romania, and now I'm based in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, 
Yes, and I, I was actually taking some notes with, uh, when uh, Akshat was uh, talking because, um, um, yeah, for me, um, I feel like, like he said, you know, I realized I was part of some certain bubbles that were a bit self-negating in a way that uh, did not respond to my background or to any of my further like lifelong curiosities and investments in art or philosophy or something like that. And then I discovered a series of readings and I rediscovered poetry, which was my first love, so to speak. And um, yeah, this kind of opened up new um, pathways. And I discovered Iranian poetry. And I feel like some of us here are in um, Jason's course as well. And um, part of the effort in the previous seminars was also to draft this kind of like new imagination that can can emerge from let's say very unchosen conditions of existence or um yeah let's say from from a place where reality is just chaos um and in in that pathway i i, I try to reimagine you know my country's past engagement with uh, <laughs> past collective dreams and its disillusionments and then the failure and then yeah geopolitical mess now fake news and all this um, conundrum and poetry has been yeah a very um, um, faithful friend and I, I also discovered that it's closer to futurology the future than you know to the past or it's not an antiquated necessarily um, form of thought and then as a as my um, as a pastime that like really healing pastime i've been listening to um, earth eater the new album i think it was released just before the pandemic and i discovered i discovered taylor swift 10 years later <laughs> but i'm really into her oh my song. god uh yeah not the co cottage core thing but what's um, I don't know, like stuff that I missed in the early 2010s when I thought she's not a good artist. And then there's this uh, super nice um, uh, one season series, animated series called uh, Midnight Gospel, which is, do you know it? <laughs> which is like, there's this guy who lives in a distant planet and he has a computer an, an assistant computer well uh yeah it's not very enlightened from that point of view so the computer still functions as his personal servant and um basically he has this huge portal that looks like a vulva or yeah two, looks like two labias and he put his head in head in there and he's like uh parachuted to different universes and with every episode you realize that um these are the stages of grief that he goes through after losing his mother. And basically it's like uh, an allegory of, uh, I don't know, like psychedelic or experiment with psychedelics and attempts to heal trauma through them. And yeah, that's, that's um, in my last article, I actually investigated just that and I've been discovering, I don't know, working with language transformers. Those were my, let's say, uh, interplanetary <laughs> assistants, so to speak. Uh, and yeah, since I'm in the Netherlands, I've also experimented a bit with psychedelics. And uh, yeah, I can, I will be glad to send you my work if you're interested. That's, that's a pretty good collection of stuff. Um, Next here is Daria Jetmakova, Jetmakova, Jetmanova, Daria Jetmanova. Yeah, hi, I'm Daria Getmanova. Yeah, Getmanova. Uh, okay. yeah, okay. Um, I'm based uh, between Kyiv and Mariupol, uh, Ukraine. Um, I've been thinking like um, uh, this first part of the seminar about um, my experience and maybe 
um, what um, I realized that the main feeling uh, it's maybe uh, this um, kind of um, hungriness so uh, a very um, big huge desire for a physical uh, presence uh, together with your peers or um, your friends um, in um, some uh, lecture room or some like public lecture and um, I uh, remembered that um, I um, faced like um, three different failures so it was in Kyiv and I came for the lecture it was like the first public lecture uh, for a long time like my first um, the first lecture is um, a person who will be physically present in the room, but uh, this time this uh, professor decided to make some kind of an experiment and um, she just made a video and we just like watched the whole uh, the whole lecture was like video of her and I've um, and no um, physical presence and it was repeated like three times um, and then came uh, Cave Biennial uh, and um, it was mainly like um, a wedding so like a kind of post-Soviet wedding when uh, your whole when your relatives uh, came to the party and you see all of them and you just don't realize how it's really possible to see all these people uh, but maybe the main uh, conclusion from all this experience and from biennial itself is just um, actually the question, um, do we need biennial at all? And how they uh, should, um, I don't know, operate after uh, the pandemic in a post-pandemic world. So like maybe uh, they should be more than just a wedding or something like that. Yeah, okay, we'll talk about that too. In this, there, there will be a session on the like creative reality and exhibition making. Um, and I think that was the last, because we have three people here, which I don't know if are here. Alexandra Collins, Mustafa El Barudi. Oh, Mustafa is here. here. He just had his camera Mustafa on, and, so. and, and Anna Lorenz. So, okay, Mustafa, you go first. Hi, hello everyone. Um, can you hear me well? Because my internet is kind of cutting up at the moment. Super good. Go ahead. Uh, Super good. Um, uh, uh, okay, where to start? Like I, um, uh, I my 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 relationship with art is like pretty recent, so I'm not sure like uh, what's my input here. But um, uh, my name is Mustafa, and I'm an architect from Cairo. And but uh, I worked with. Um, uh, of different forms of uh, digital image production and processing from generative design to immersive and interactive experiences and 3D graphics. Um, and uh, uh, like I made, I made some work, like I, I made some like production, like 3D graphics production for some artists, but I, I am in the process of like, it's pretty recent, this shift is pretty recent and I'm in the process of shaping uh, an artistic practice. Um, but uh, a, a recent experience that is relevant here is um, uh, an exhibition uh, curated by Bassem El Baruni was Infra Ontologies, and I worked with one of the artists uh, in, 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 in producing a video uh, uh, for the for the exhibition, and I kind of like a, a had a look up over the uh, other works, and uh, it was really inspiring. Uh, and of course, yeah, Bassam is of one course. of the best. Bassam is one of the best curators who doesn't produce enough work because of the kind of like ahead of timeness that he he has. And is like I say that he also curated yeah. a piece of my my work into an exhibition years ago, 2015, in Ashkal Alwan Homeworks. And he's also a very dear friend, and we share a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and also succession, of course, uh, that's, that's, um, like, uh, new question. Yeah, we have to, but you know, like, just like, you know what I mean? I see Nick and I respect Nick's taste and opinion a lot. So like Nick's succession is like, 
you got to get out of like, you know, like the, uh, you know, got to think dialectically. What I love about Succession, and it's not even intended by the artists or makers, is like they make the average American aware of the patheticness of, of the life, lives of the rich people in the most amazing way without actually wanting to, uh, like wanting to, they don't intend to show how pathetic they are. It just, but it just sinks into you. Also, also just through spatial arrangements, they make you familiar with the opulence and the decadence of this life. They don't mean that. They try to just like make it look exactly like how rich people live. But the side effect of that is like you become really like aware of like the lives of people that you never probably in your life will ever interact with. And I think that's why I I like it. And basically, if like it's also like basically experiencing the pandemic of the rich or the other, right? You kind of like imagine how these people. I mean, you know where that apartment is. They're supposed to live across from the Met, right? Like every time they're leaving across the street is like the, one of the most important museums in, in the world, right? Like, so they live in this like casual apartment across from the Met. And yeah, so for me, and also like the brutal way in which uh, underclass and non-rich people are treated in the series is really because as often the ethicalness of like every time in, in normal films or theater or, or TV series or any kind of like narrative, when, when a rich person or a powerful person does something awful to someone below them, there's usually a reaction shot to show how, how terrible that impacted the person. They consciously stay away from that. Rich people in this film step on poor people and the camera just follows the rich people without paying any attention to what happened mm. to the person. And that to me is like one of the most powerful way to show you how, I mean, gross and evil these people are just casually by nature, right? That's yeah, why I like it. I don't yeah. like it for like, you know, yeah, of course. And also, and, like, uh, they are very boring in terms of style, right? The fashion is just very tame thing. There's this episode where Kendall buys these shoes, I don't know, like a Raph Simmons shoes, and they, they, he can't own it. It's just boring shit. It's just decoration is boring. The fashion is boring. They have no sense of, like, aesthetic sensibility. It's just vulgar people. Um, so uh, next, then, I think the last one is Ana Lorenzo. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, I had my camera off because it's raining a lot here in the internet very bad. <laughs> um, I'm based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Greetings. <laughs> and I think the I think the aesthetical experience the, that I would like to make a brief comment here would be uh, I spent the last year basically um, producing a it was it was supposed supposed to be like a, a a short course, but it was all going to be reported. So I didn't want to just talk to the camera and then people be seeing my face because it was about, it was a, 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 short, a course about how art and nature could be, could be worked through artists in local context. So we could foster uh, eco ecological thinking, sociability, everything. And so I actually had the, the chance to go interview some artists that work with that along here in the state of Rio de Janeiro. And I've been able to, to go to the places they, they work and interview them, interview the places. And it was like four, four different artists, all women artists, and they work in very interesting contexts. One of them was in the in a small city here, that is the, oh, we don't, I'm liking this, this word in English. It is in the place where a river meets the, the, the ocean. And it is a very specific place here in Brazil where the sea, the sea levels are raising like four meters a year. And it's, it's absurdly because in 30 years, we have like 13, 14 blocks of the city already taken by, by the sea and it is an intertwinement of many different things it is also but not only because of the ecological crisis and well and those people are working with the the local memory of the citizens of the city and how they they cope and how they deal with this erosion and how they do with their lives because they still live in there and they still want to live there they really don't want to lose the place want to live there and that was really strong how the artists are working there alongside philosophers because this project is, is has actually been put forth by a philosopher and an artist. And well, that's a, and I did produce like 
I think seven episodes with 25 minutes of interviews on those things. So I think that's the most interesting thing. Okay, that's pretty interesting. You know, what's the town exactly? Is it Paratino? Was it the town? No, it is Atafona. Okay, because it in is, Parachi, it, like, I think it's an actually interesting thing that um, the architecture of the cities made it so that water from the sea, when the sea levels rise, the waters from the sea get into the city and then get out. And it's sort of, this is the cleaning system of the city. It's kind of like, is this very old colonial architecture uh, thing, but the, the, it's made so that the water can come into the streets and then out again when the tide uh, goes down so like the tide kind of like cleans out the city it's kind of this weird way of dealing with the end of the world i suppose um but it was very sadly, sadly it's not something so cool like that it's actually more of the river doesn't have the volume of water that it needed to oh. have because we are taking it all off here for rio de janeiro it has okay. like two thirds of its water volume taken up so the yeah. you know, sea is getting in because of that I see, I see, I see. That's just kind of sad. Um, so let's, uh, that's, yeah, it was a great, like, sort of arrangement of people, I guess, that we got from this for this season. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen and we'll do this like little presentation that's trying to introduce some of the most of the themes that we'll be discussing and kind of hinting at what we might be talking about in the next kind of two months. Okay. Just share my screen real quickly here. The only, the only thing is, uh... Romola, we didn't think that the basic introduction of the participants will take this long. So we just have to maybe like rush through the bios of the guests a little bit to just catch up for the time or maybe rush through the notes, right? But yeah, no, I, but, I'll do it more rushed, I guess. But I, I mean, yeah, but the, also, the bios. But also, but also, I thought this was really fantastic because like you provided like a, such a great context to know where, where everybody's coming from and sort of like the kind of like debate we will have hopefully with the participation of not just our two guests but like the but like the the, the rest of the panelists right yeah yeah so so can you see my screen right now yes yeah, right just this presentation right yeah, can you, if i do this yeah. if i do this you can still see the screen right or no yes yeah okay yeah it's good okay so uh, yeah the first as i said this is the just to introduce some of the teams um and I'll just focus a little bit on what we mean by post-pandemic here. Like, the, we know that the pandemic's not really over, but it's just like, it's post in the sense of post-punk, like, uh, the, like the initial impact of the pandemic has been absorbed. We have thought about it, you know, this is already like a, a situation we have been facing, we have been uh, dealing with uh, like conceptually. And like, I, I know that a lot has been said about the pandemic already, like in 2020, everyone was talking about it, it was even like, irritating right like every philosopher had to say something and it was like curiously the same thing that ha they have been saying for like 20 years already so it's like it curiously fit their like scheme of thought but just I just like just to begin the debate actually what was interesting to me was that um i compare it to 9 11 a lot right in terms of like a like a catastrophic event that changes the paradigm and i think it was more more convincing because when because because of it dealing with nature and science rather than politics geopolitics and political economy right so mm -hmm. I think it was more impactful because when 9/11 happened it actually took a while for people to take it seriously a lot of people kind of like thought of it as oh media spectacle or oh, it's a conspiracy or oh, America did it itself blah 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 all that stuff right but the pandemic was much more powerful in terms of like impacting and basically post pandemic began basically a week after after because the shock was absorbed quite quickly go ahead yeah and uh so i was interested not in the pandemic but like i was interested in the pandemic uh on everything about the pandemic but the pandemic itself and kind of like i was trying to interested in this phenomenological like, subjective experience of the lockdown and how it intersects with this objective like scientific uh, happening right and also kind of in the long long-term effect of the pandemic of how the pandemic might act as this sort of event in the like by the UN sense of like how do we look for, for art in like a thousand years from years from now and see the effect of the pandemic there or like not really that the, the, the pandemic caused these effects but the pandemic is paradigmatic of these simultaneous changes that are happening in relation to the art world it's like this very specific moment uh which is like a new role for um uh, art, I suppose, which is like 
how how do we feed exactly the uh, romantic idea of art in this new like social media infused world right i think the pandemic kind of like showed our museum art as this kind of bubble and, and i mean like both financial and conceptual um and like kind of like busted it a little bit and preview what's behind which is art as this kind of obsolete historical category which is secondary now to the installation of a social media persona. Like you don't do art, you don't, don't have a social media persona to, in order to become an artist. You do art in order to become this sort of social media persona. Um, so that's, that's the just, kind to, of just, to, just to add that, right? Like, and this is like one of the main sort of like reasons why we were, ha we were having this seminar is that this is something I also worked on on a, on a workshop on memes that took place last year in December or November in Rotterdam. We did it, of course, online with Zoom because we couldn't go there because of the pandemic. And like basically talking about how pandemic kind of like ended the whole era of like memes and influencers and how we're so lucky in this, in this weightlessness where like things don't have the weight or value they had, they might like some other form of gravity will give weight and meaning to things later. But right now, everything is just so sort of like suspended in the air. We don't know what's going to become important, what's going, to, what's going to happen. And one of the reasons we're having the seminar is to try to probe and see where these new centers of gravity for value, for valuation and for significance will be and what they will be. But one of the things that I personally am interested in finding out through discussion with our guests and through doing the exercises and and writings that we have to do, which we're going to later find out about at the end of the end of the session, is the sort of like the, the erasure of the category of meaning or its transformation to a mere surface to cover the new function and ontology of art. And that was really apparent in the politics that emerged in the middle of pandemics, right? Like, so we're dealing with like a, a sort of a natural slash health scientific disaster. But what we really cared for was was Black Lives Matter. That's what caused a global uprising rather than the pandemic and the health crisis, right? Because we feel much more comfortable kind of like going back and finding things that were valuable to us prior to pandemic and kind of like still react to that, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that is also shows itself in, in the sort of like hyper politicization of sort of like art and the sort of like the you know, like this type of like political art that's being kind of like promoted by a lot of institutions these days. And I think for, for me, this is this is like this 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 old surface that's gonna crack is becoming has to be more convincing in its last like last like moments of existence, right? Which is and kind of like about, the, the the a romantic idea of art, right? Like this idea of a cult of originality and the genius and this kind of like catharsis and seeing art as this transcendental sublime thing and like uh, and like self-actualization of the artist, you know, all that is gone basically right now already. Uh, and the pandemic kind of epitomizes that, right? No, but, the, like, but those uh, are gone. But the last remaining thing is like this meaningful political social function of art that is a lot of artists and institutions are still kind of like holding on as like, and to me, this also will follow with like the myth of the genius artist and the myth of the romantic artist. I think this is also could be on its way out, on its way out. And it's basically in its last instance, it has to do its last sort of like last shine, right? And, yeah. um, and I think, and I think what, what I see is basically move from aesthetics towards the aesthetics of power in late capitalism. Yeah. And, you know, if we go by a lower regal's definition of what is, what is art, which he defined in the, in his like really important book that only got translated into English in 2004. And unfortunately there's no PDF of it to share. And I'm in the process of translating the book to Farsi is that he sees art as the co a human's contestation with nature, which meaning sort of like telling, like, like basically we deal with the insecurity of not knowing the complexity of nature. And he basically traces this from like uh, beginning, of, beginning of time, like cave art, right? Like, like basically for him, humans begin painting animals and trees and nature because they want to like feel that they also can, they also can compete with nature and actually improve upon it by by stylizing it and if the tree is a little bit like weird humans will paint it a little bit more symmetrical to say here my tree is actually better than nature so if art is this contestation with nature what we see now is like art is 
is in co competition with third or fourth nature, which is late capitalism. And this is totally why you see something like NFT, which is just basically, basically about money and power. So art is saying like, oh, crypto is the thing. Well, guess what? We, art's going to do its own crypto and it's going to be even like better and more pretty than regular crypto or regular digital finance, you know? And again, mm -hmm. I'm just like throwing ideas, ideas. This doesn't mean I'm convinced with these. We're here to basically debate and argue and, and verify some of these ideas that we'll all have. So yeah, it's not like I'm talking on the top of my head, but I'm also just proposing hypotheses. These are not like proven stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I think we're talking about that like a lot in the, the uh, art and technology session, which is the sixth, but, uh, and also a little bit later in, today in the presentation. But uh, what I think the, the question really is right now is like, what has, what would art, both what will art become and what, uh, where will the notions of the 18th century, like European art go to? because this will also continue existing, but in other uh, places that are not art. Um, and I think if we got to think about the future of art, we got to think of the future of everything else and like what's exactly in place in terms of like who is thinking about the future. This is a good like kind of diagram that uh, Helen Ben Susan made for a triple one percent post, uh, which is um, this kind of political compass a little bit, but in relation to nihilism and in relation to capital. So these are people who are like, um, in their their uh, uh, reaction phase, the loss of meaning is like positive and optimist, and this is negative, right? And their relation to the evolution of capital and the social organization that we're going through is uh, positive and negative, right? Maybe, so maybe this explain the four categories one more time because even I didn't catch it. So what is so NAP? This what is nihilism, NAP? like nihilism positive and nihilism negative, capital positive and capital negative basically. And this is like, this includes new rats and like Landians even like right and left accelerationists. This includes like classic Marxist Adornians critical theory. This includes like Laturians, uh, Agamben, you know, Stengers, and also like traditionalists. If you think about it, they're in the same kind of feud, which is like reaction to both things. They, get, they don't like after they, they don't like the lack of meaning. They want to go back to this sort of like origin of meaning. Uh, so like Heideggerians, uh, any sort of traditionalist perennialists. And this, he puts like a question mark, but I think this exists. This is maybe like futurists or something like people who are positive about the lack of meaning, but negative about capital. Um, which That's kind of like us, right? Like I think yeah. myself immediately. It's, it, and a it's an interesting mark. position. It's an interesting position. I mean, maybe some, some Laruelians could be that, you know, trying to think of like this very speculative scenario where meaning is, uh, the lack of meaning is good and the uh, lack of capital is bad, uh, the, the advancement of capital is bad. Um, so I think you gotta like, I think the failure of Agamben in thinking about the pandemic is kind of a failure of his cosmopolitical party a little bit, which is the, the animus and the commons, you know, I'm not really very against Agamben personally. I think some of his insights are actually kind of more relevant now than they were at the beginning of the pandemic, but I think he just set him up for kind of failure in this uh, way. And uh, there's a good Bratton text that, uh, that argues that like these ideas of Agamben are already imbued in his previous works, right? And there's a good like Nancy story, uh, John Luke Nancy that like, he had like a heart problem and he went to a gum and a gum and said, oh, don't trust the doctors, you know, just do your stuff, just do your <laughs> like medieval stuff. And, uh, and then he and died. I, no, 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 that was before. And, I, and Nancy says, uh, if I trusted like a gum and I would be dead, which he is right now, but like not because of that, right? It was before the, his death. But uh, I mean, it sort of almost killed Nancy before, a couple of years before. Uh, but, uh, but I think like both people in this like, uh, nihilist like negative veins are kind of like stuck in the capitalist realist framework. They, I don't think they can see really see the future. I think the only people who are seriously thinking about the future and you can disagree with me are the neorats like who are thinking of the mathematical intellectual conditions of the future and the Laruelians maybe we are thinking of the metaphysical kind of reinvigoration of specul speculative thought, you know. Uh, and I think the pandemic really highlighted this incapacity to think of the future within re reality of like some strains of academic thought, especially left wing thought. Um, and I think we got to be more open to how the pandemic impacts ahead in the very far future. Like we got to start thinking of like collective intelligence, Google as a promotion of intelli collective intelligence and in computer science as like literacy, you know, as a form of literacy, you need to know computer science. And by using reasoning as a, like a future common perception, you got to know it. Uh, and instead of like flattening scales as Latour does, we need like more scalability. We need like to think with scales as a primary attribute of perspectivation. Um, I think a common way that people use to think about the future is this fantasy right right now in sci-fi landscapes. Um, there's this famous parable um, in Philip K. Dick's uh, 
book, uh, like a, a tale, a short story called The Preserving Machine, which is this tale about the, how this machine transmogrifies mu music sheets into living matter, into like animals. So like you put it in like a Beethoven and it comes out like a bird or something like that. You can put it in like a, I don't know, Schubert and a deer comes out. And then uh, the living matter starts to, to get wild and become new types of music. And when he puts, the doctor puts like an insect back into, into the machine, it, it, it's supposed to sound like Bach, but it sounds like this wild, like broken, noisy thing. Um, and the problem I think with fantasy, just like the doctor in Philip K. Dick's story, is, is that it, it is often very stuck in like this humanoid and carbonic imaginations of the future, which is like these beings of two arms and two legs and eyes, you know. And if you think about the future, like, uh, very, very far ahead, we probably don't even have bodies. We probably have this abstract situation. Um, and, and, and so the, the view of art in sci-fi sci and fantasy stories is kind of very parochial still. And this is, I think, very clear in like soundtracks, like John Williams for Star Wars. It's like a Brahms re remake of Brahms, like a very classic tonal composition. It's a like very old thing, it's a very classic thing. And like the future of logical to interject. Kind of uh, no, right. finish your sentence. I'll do it after. No, yeah, I think the just the painting and dance that acts that happens within like fantasy novels very very conservative. Usually, it's art is always seen within the romantic parameters that the books are made uh, uh, in terms of, right? So it's like it's always very parochial. I don't get like a new Im imagination of art in this art works, like in this yeah. fantasy art works. Yeah. Mine is basically a summary of a, of a short sci-fi story I wrote years ago, actually. This, this belongs to the year 2013. It's basically about this. Uh, they basically thought like they created this computer and they fed all the art history books and all the artworks ever existed in human, human history to this machine. And they gave this computer an art show and they thought like this machine will synthesize everything and will produce the best artworks ever, right? And there were like mm -hmm. media coverage of this and all that. And then when the computer produced the art, it was all like minimalist gray, minimalist gray, uh, <laughs> minimalist gray canvases, right? And there was like a whole bunch of like right wing reactions to it saying like, why did we spend all the money on this? This is terrible. Minimalists were doing this back in the seventies and no one liked it. And you know what I mean? All that. And they decided to like destroy the machine and then they use this part for, for stuff. And then the technician, the technician that was like basically uh, tasked uh, uh, with, with like breaking the machine apart and making use of it in different government agencies and all that actually was able to, he discovered like a certain memory part in the machine and actually realized the machine was kind of like creating that based on the expectation that was, that he picked up from the society, but he was mm -hmm. actually making some art very hidden and closeted for itself. And what was that art was like kitschy paintings of, of bird cages and birds because that was his or her or their fantasy of being grounded and always like thinking of birds being the most amazing creatures because they can fly and go around. So there mm -hmm. were like a bunch of like paintings of bird cages and birds that the machine had done for itself. But by that time it was too late to show those, but also it was also embarrassment because there was nothing new in this painting. They just look like Sunday paintings of anyone who would just paint bird cages and all that. So that I that's mean, that's that's my point. I think with uh, um, again, like generative adversarial networks, that like all of them somehow they are exactly like this Roberto Mata paintings, <laughs> which is like why are they like going to the same sort of aesthetics every time? Uh, is it the problem of the data set? Is it a problem? Is it, or is it like, did Roberto Mata actually figure out the, the space of abstraction of imagination? Is this like what our collective imagination looks like? Um, but I think, yeah, I think, I think like Gennard, even when it's beautiful, it's kind of like quiche by virtue of being actually automatically generated and to make yeah. like predictive you know, art. Ale go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Alexander Galloway years ago said every visual Every every visualization of the internet looks like a cauliflower. <laughs> but but actually, my response to him was because I was actually at that seminar at NYU. I said that's because internet is a cauliflower. So what do you expect these these uh, illustrations to end up being? They're just all going to be like cauliflower, right? And that's the yeah. conundrum you're dealing with right now in your example that you showed. Uh, yeah. So kind of like I was also interested in how. Um, like this very, this futuristic visions, they always like mix up, um, uh, are mixed like rearrangements of old uh, visions, right? So that's kind of like the word making thesis of Nelson Goodman, kind of like every new word is made up of like 
uh, old remakes, rearrangements, and reassemblages of old works. Um, and um, this is very clear in like the art right now, like uh, structurally cinema, which is the example I put, I put right now. Uh, I, I'm not going to play it because I think it might like cause a copyright thing. But uh, they, he used to use like these Hollywood movies and like kind of repeat them a lot to, because he said he says that like these movies are full of this latent sexual drive that if you like pick the pick them up and like cut them out and really repeat some parts you kind of like can liberate this sort of uh, tension that's happening in the in the movie which is kind of interesting but it's just like this view of, views of the future as the remake of the past um i think um to truly imagine a future, we, right now we must imagine it outside of any word. Instead of reinstating, like we must like go against Biedman, I think. Instead of just reinstating this ontological like infused data or laying with nostalgia or just making sampling and pastiche, I think we need to think of like I, I, Catherine Adams has a good text about that, but which is like statelessness. This is the concept of like the stateless as this like life form that exists without words. Um, I think we need to think of a future that like that includes uh, forms of art like life forms without words that uh, instead of just repeating uh, and remixing stuff. Since um, Catherine's here, maybe maybe Catherine wants to say a few words about it because you know what I mean. I think we should leave room for people to jump in also, just like how I'm jumping in and you're jumping in. Yeah. My talk. So sure, sure, go ahead, sure, Catherine. Sure. Maybe explain the piece because we really were impressed by it and it was really lovely. Oh sure, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Romulo. Um, yeah, I um. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about this problem where we have this model of world making that assumes that any possible world is a kind of recomposition of some kind. And I was kind of concerned about thinking of, um, uh, let's say, a life form that was not, well, actually, like a kind of um, transversal space that was of these worlds, but couldn't really be made like legible within them. Um, and I kind of tried to um, conceptualize this in terms of statelessness. So it's like a geopolitical metaphor, but I think, I mean, as, as you were mentioning, I think it's also um, maybe relevant here just to think about like, um, out to, to kind of think outside of like a calculus of just like kind of re reproducing old forms. But also I think another maybe key thing in that text for me was like to think about this beyond just thinking of like a space of exception, but to think that maybe this like other possibility that doesn't quite fit into a combinatoric logic is something about like a form of like passage, like a kind of almost like vectorial like passage or something like this. So I was kind of trying to think through that, like all within the frame of like a kind of good Nelson Goodman like world making starting point, but just sort of open that up a bit. Would the, would the film Annihilation be kind of like a good example of that? Because that's what your, te your text made me think of the, the film Annihilation. Yeah. I don't know, have you seen it or not? Um, you know, I don't know if I've actually seen that. Yeah, unless I'm not- I was, I was gonna include that as an example, actually, of, of some way of thinking of non, a different world that is not made up of like, uh, we remade forms, which is pretty interesting. I, mm -hmm. I like that movie. No, but that, no, that is that that, is, that that film actually illustrates what Catherine is saying because it's like it's made from parts of this world. But no, in but no in the way, end, yeah, exactly, 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 exactly. But in no way could have come from this world. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I assume most people have seen it, right? Or no? It's an alien. It's an alien thing, right? It's the the alien life form, which is, this is different from everything else we've ever seen, right? It is very interesting, an interesting conception, I think. Um, and also I was thinking uh, that we, if you need to think of the future of art, we need to think of the cycles of fashion and how they happen. Like this, uh, the waves of art is like cyclical dialectical movement of history um, of like minimization and maximization, you know, that I think Wolflin's uh, dialect between classic and Baroque really encapsulates well, which is like movements of art always happens in this sort of like, first you expand and uh, put on uh, as much detail as, as you can. And then there's a movement that sort of like cleans it up into a score, you know, this kind of mix in my uh, expansion, like di dilash, dilate, dilation, like dilation and, and refraction, right? Um, and, and, and thinking of any future of art, I think we need to consider this structure of trend setting that underlies this, this remaking of the future. And even maybe to parameterize it statistically, that's a way of like thinking of the future. Um, and how this, 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 this trends, they have like class undertones of like the rich kind of like 
uh, appropriating the, the popular culture of the poor, you know, or like uh, age gap undertones of like the young people kind of reappropriating the old people like sort of fashion, right? Which the, the concept of vintage and this sort of stuff, the, this sort of gentrification between ages. Um, and think of how these movements can all be kind of manipulated by the market, this fashion movements, this all can, they, they are not really like spontaneous, you know, they, they can be manipulated. Um, and that like fashion is this sort of influx that requires this free exchange and this sort of conversation that the pandemic blocked, uh, at, like um, Akshat was mentioning, like to make art, you need some material, you need the, the, the convivial material of life itself to create the art and to like create a new form of like clothing. You need to converse, like need to get into dialogue with other people. And in the, in the pandemic, you didn't have that. You only had that through this like software labyrinths that were already in place, kind of like the references, the exchange of references was made by way of the digital conversations and Zoom and this kind of UX design architectures, you know? So you know, we're kind of very tamed by this architecture in terms of how we can dialogue with one another the, like fashion was defined by the like communication tubes that we already had in place when the pandemic started right um so i think one way that fashion kind of unfolds without the sort of external contacts between beans is memes and like the sort of languages of the internet which they kind of like are acquire and then they dissolute uh, and they kind of represent these deep linguistic kind of traumas and they, re they, they, they reveal this kind of latent reserves of collective thoughts and feelings, you know, but they also have waves. You have these fresh memes, this kind of up, up and coming memes, and suddenly it's they're saturated, and it's exhausted, and you, and you abandon the meme. And this is kind of like the, the wave of fashion that happens within the digital environment, right? Um, just a second. And in yeah, curation, just... I think... Yeah, yeah, go ahead, man. Well, yeah. So the interesting thing, like, Two, two things, two things that, that, that comes to mind is sort of like uh, what was getting into fashion right in the beginning of the pandemic was the sort of like early 90s club kid look, right? And then as the kids around the world got into the club kids, all the clubs closed down. So there was this like cognitive dissonance between what kids were wearing. So then they say in Berlin, you would see all these like really sad, depressed teenagers, like I mean, young people dress as like 90s club kids. I remember 90s, I'm old enough to remember the club kids, right? We'd all club, and then we just go to each other's homes and try to kind of like do what normally you should be doing with this fashion in the nightclubs, right? So that was kind of like, and then, and then the other impact, I don't know if you want to go to the next slide. No, we can, but I mean, I think that's very interesting, like how the fashion is kind of like very predictable, like 10 years ago is bad, 20 years ago is kind of vintage already, you know, it's kind of like, it's very predictable, the shapes of yeah, history. Yeah, but the pandemic kind of broke that because kind of yeah, like yeah, yeah, 20 yeah, yeah, years yeah. ago, yeah, you know, it just broke it. Yeah, of course, and, and I think curation is exactly this sort of game, like poker game, where you bet on what's like, Low, you, you buy when it's low, it's sell when it's high, you know, you got to know what's coming in, you know, you got to buy, uh, buy, buy low and sell high and sell to these idiots that are seeing your show, they, they are buying the thing that you, you know it's already over, you know, um, so you got to start like appropriating stuff that is still coming, up and coming, you know, uh, the next slide, yeah, I, and I, I think like you also got to think of how the pandemic kind of shifts perception, um, in general, like this aesthetic shift and like how this sort of focused media products emerged, like podcast culture became huge and clubhouse and sort of uh, kind of media that you need to be focused on. And also this type of like TikTok as it's just sort of multiple cinema that emerged and like stories, we gotta think of stories as this type of audiovisual entertainment that we have, right? This is the major form of cinema we have right now. Um, and I think what shifted, like, like the values that we used to make, like the European uh, notion of art, are in this minor cultural forms. Like, what do you think the like the artistic visionaries of modernism would be doing today? Do, do you think they would be in galleries? I don't know. I, I maybe they would be like running a meme page or something like that and making memes or like doing a crazy kind of Instagram and kind of like this performatic thing, because the art world is kind of this aristocratic class, not really like. I don't know if it represents those wheels, romantic wheels that art used to represent, right? Um, but I think these two tendencies happen, this kind of like simultaneous digitalization of exhibitions that like, like people are bringing theater plays to like the a Facebook live or something like that. And the exhibitionalization of the digital, like taking online environments and, the, and they become sort of art practices in themselves. Um, 
and, and like this, there, there's a new attention regimen involved in that, right? Go ahead, Mo. Yeah, so, so maybe, maybe, no, I, I, I thought you're going to the next slide because I was going to talk about the sort of like how this emergence of these new media spaces like podcasts and podcasting, Clubhouse, all that. Uh, one of the things that I, I keep an eye on, something happened to the slide, right? I only, yeah, I see a slide. Yeah, something happened, but I, I've been, ever since I joined Facebook, I've been, I've been, I've been keeping an eye on how the self-representations of artists on social media, how they, what they show of themselves, like artists who have a career, artists who have artist representation with galleries or like they're in the hype cycle of curators, you know, how they self-represent, right? And yeah, right? So basically it was very interesting. So what I noticed was like lack of travel and lack of exhibitions and lack of institutional support turn artists into sort of like solo institutions or whatever we come up group uh, collectively to, co to call this, right? Like artists felt the need to kind of like write their own official uh, press releases and present themselves in a more official and institutional way on social media, right? So you see all this like, self-congratulatory stuff and constant self-promotion that kind of became a way of replacing uh, what institutions used to do for you or like your perception of what institutions were doing for you. And if you go to the next slide, I made, I made fun of it. I didn't name the artist on the social media, but like a perfect example of that, the next one, you can go full screen actually, because then we don't see your interface. Something yeah. happened to your screen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But if, if, if I do this, next... do you still see the screen? If I do this, are you still seeing Yeah, yeah, yeah. It? We see everything. Yeah, yeah. We see, we see. Okay. yeah, totally. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so basically, next... like, see, like, this is like, this is like the style of like, yeah, the next one. Yeah, so, so I, I, I took out A. Bronson, right? A. a. Bronson is an almost 80 year old artist. He is world famous. He's represented by two very important galleries. Maureen Paley in London and Esther Schiffer in Berlin. He is award-winning. He's been given many PhDs. Uh, there's actually artists now that make art about AA, video art, documentaries, right? But he's relentlessly self-promoting online. And I actually screenshot all these along to all the other screenshots in the category called anthropology of contemporary art, right? It's a perfect example of like this. And you know what I mean? Drumola was telling me in the discussion we had, like, like, oh, maybe this is about that kind of dopamine you get. And I said, I don't, I wish it was that. This is more about sort of like the fear of missing out. The fear, if I don't do that, nobody else will be doing it, right? Which in a case of AA, that's not true because AA got an army of people promoting him, right? But you, but you also see that in like basically so many like artists and curators that make fun of, you know, like Obris and the way he kind of like has become the obituary of, obituary of the art world. The minute somebody died, Obris is on it. There's a picture of Obris with the person who died, sometimes very sarcastically because the person's dead, but Obris in the picture next to them is laughing. So like, it's like- It's very weird. But you're laughing and this person's dead. What do you, what do you mean by that? But like, it just needs to like show that like, hey, I'm relevant, you know? Another thing was like, curious and artists kept bringing up their good shows or something from the past and saying like, hey, this is like a from the time machine. Two years ago, I did this amazing show and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, we remember that. But it's like, yeah. So it's like, it really shifted. The pandemic really shifted artist self-representation on social media compared to like, say, the earlier years of, earlier years of Facebook and say like Instagram and all that. Yeah, and like uh, at the same time that brands become sort of more like people, try to appear more like people, people are, are trying to become more like brands, like corporates, right? So they're doing the, you're doing your own PR, you're becoming your own. So it's the opposite, company. right? If corporations took on the, the persona of a person here, you have persons taking on the, taking on a role of the institution. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, so let's try to do like, uh, uh, we separated like four like trends that we think tendencies that we think might happen in this sort of like, near future or long-term future, I don't know. Um, the first one is kind of like algorithmic curation and predictive like uh, expectation, uh, which a good example of it. Uh, I mean, Instagram is already kind of like that, right? People, uh, uh, it's like already like this museological kind of space, um, which like, it, it, like, it, like this, this is like a Instagram page that uh, takes screenshots of like this product of Mercado Livre, which is this uh, South American kind of, um, eBay or Etsy or something like that. And it just creates this like a kind of grid like that Instagram kind of uh, curates 
um, which is really just name, sexual. Let's name it properly. Let's name it properly. So the first, the first, first possible sort of like thing that that is emerging is algorithmic curation of human-made works. Exactly, Correct? and I, I yeah. think like a, a great example of that was like Spotify, right? Which is like, there's a lot of content and it's like curated by the algorithm. It's Spotify, like it's this notion of the artwork as a type of access that like no one owns the music anymore, but you just pay for the capacity to access it. And this access is like gatekept by an algorithm that filters in like an almost infinite, like enormous amount of content, which is humanly created still, at least most of it. Um, but it's curated by the, the algorithm because you can't curate it otherwise because it's too much content. Um, and this, this created a situation where chance is impossible, which is kind of interesting. Like the, the chance is like the opposite of an algorithm, right? Uh, no encounter in an algorithmic environment is random. You don't find like a book in the bookstore by mistake. You just, you are at Amazon and that's like that environment is designed to make you buy something. It's already considering your choices. So you're not like zapping the TV and you find a new movie and you like by accident, you find a new movie. There's not, there's no this sort of spontaneous kind of connection anymore because it's all already parameterized, right? And the trends are kind of being scripted as morphemes, which are controlled, right? Controlled by someone who designed the algorithm. So fashion is not really spontaneous anymore. And this kind of like perspective is basically that curators are programmers, like programmers become the curators and the artists are just as human actors in these networks that are coded, right? This is the first type of um, example. I think another example of that is influencers too. Like influencers present themselves as, as kind of like artists of existence, of producers of some kind of mode of being that is followed closely by their fans. And they like uh, the content, the curation of their content is like automat automatized by Instagram. And like live bloggers, they create this like, they spend their whole lives trying to create more and more content. They need to create more content and take the world and transform it into content for this machine that will curate whatever they're putting in. So they're feeding this machine, right? Um, but this is also to create the possibility of going against the algorithm, I suppose, which is what this Instagram page does, for example, trying to break the code or like creating a poetic drive out of the use of the, uh, like the wrong use of the algorithm, right? Something like that. Um, so I think we'll discuss a lot about that in like the session on tier to reality and maybe on the session three on like art, uh, knowledge and pedagogy too. Um, so the second tendency would be uh, predictive, not predictive compos not predictive mediation and curation, but predictive composition. So like artificial intelligence, not doing the curation, but doing the artwork itself. Um, yeah, so basically, so basically, uh, basically, machine machine produced or automated art but curated by humans the yeah exactly of the first yeah yeah exactly so you have this content which is produced by machines and you have humans selecting it and giving it meaning um this uh, so like pro the programmers are artists the artists itself are programmers who code this artworks and curators are the human mediators i think the good example of that is music libraries they sound who sell that they, they sell this like bits of sound, which are my, uh, maybe machine made or maybe made by this anonymous type of programmers or, or musicians maybe, uh, but, uh, but they sell this uh, type of sounds as non-copyrighted material for like TV openings and like advertisements, stuff like that. Uh, interesting is that the interesting is that this type of, this, one of the places that this type of work emerged was like 1970s por porn soundtracks, right? So there were yeah, all these, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. great musicians who didn't want their name attached to this because it was yeah. dirty, right? But they didn't make money. So they made like great beats, great little pieces, right? And mm -hmm. then they will make them available. The, the songs didn't have names. The musicians didn't have names, right? And then they mm -hmm. will make this like, so sort of like really high quality, so sort of like funk, disco, rock, country rock available. And then porn producers, they would just pick the right sound out of this catalog of nameless, almost machine produced sounds. It's just for the money, that, yeah, it's just for the money. Yeah. Half the example of it is like Deep Throat and movies of that genre. They all mm -hmm. have this like, their soundtracks were humanly put together, but from this nameless, almost like generic catalog of sound, right? Yeah, but and this what is I like... Was gonna, but what I was gonna say uh, is that, uh, um, you know, with the proliferation of artists, like proliferation of MFA programs and like, just like everybody being an artist, 
we're almost an analog version of that. We're like curators have this relationship these days with artists. Artists are no longer important. You know what I mean? The curator basically can pick out of 3 million feminist practices, those few that match the look and the space and the, I don't know, the plan that they have, right? Because there's a whole slew of people just producing like this type of political work or the work that deals with this. And for, I mean, the challenges are enormous for artists, right? To produce the kind of work that not only matches the interests of institutions and curators and art dealers, but actually says something about the, the artist itself and actually transcend this the catalog, right? Yeah. And what, you, what you mean is that like just, most- just before, just before you jump in, because you have people in the class, right? And an artist in, in, in our seminar that I've been keeping an eye on is Paige. Paige's work is really, to me, it's kind of like that. Like Paige is doing a work that, that you can, curator can come in and put it in this show or that show, but actually like the kind of like aesthetics and the kind of stuff she does around it, it really, you look at it and you know it's Paige. This can be coming out of any other artist. And yeah, I, I just wish that her camera was on and, and she could basically speak a little bit about like how she does this work. Also her interest in pop music, singing on stage and, and the way she does it is like, yeah. So Paige, t t tell us how you do this a little bit or maybe more. Um, what, which part do you want me to speak about? Like how I do? <laughs> like, like, I, mean, I mean, I don't want to go back to the romantic notion of the genius and, and like, the, you know, but, but like how you basically, how you are not just like another artist that deals with like ecology and anthropocene and nature, because you do deal with that, right? But then your work has a type of quality that only Paige can do. And it, like, I can't say, oh, okay, let's not include Paige, let's include this other person. Can I, no, no can, I, can I ask you that actually? I think actually that Paige curates herself a little bit, um, which is kind of interesting. And maybe that's what artists can do to like- uh, So what do you mean? Create you mean this sort of personality. So Paige has found a way to not only produce the work, but also curate it. Yeah, because maybe that's the kind of function of because if all art is kind of becoming robotic, that's then the, the person that is giving meaning to the art and creating the meaning out of it, like giving an arrow of meaning is the curator, right? You were the one that is like landing your kind of personality and sensibility to the art so that it becomes meaningful. Um, well, let's, let's give her time to either confirm what you said or, or add something to it or, or reject it completely. Um. I guess I've never thought about it as um, self curation, but um, but I I could see how that could make sense. I've just never thought about it in that way. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm not sure how to answer your question, Mo, without making it like an extremely long um, dialogue. I don't well, like. Think about it then. Think about it because we will re we will revisit we re we will revisit your work. Also, I think your poetry has a lot to do with it, like because the qualities in the poetry somehow move into the music, move into the visual installation, and even like what is the background you're having and the, and the, and the blue shirt you're wearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's just like the, the intentionality of that kind of um, traverses in those spaces, but it's definitely like um, an all encompassing thing. I guess that's what you're saying. It's also like with everything. No, but no, but, but also by, by talking about you, I'm, I'm talking about like sort of like the survival skills that the, that the artists need to not become a catalog today, not become like a generic, generic content producer for some schmuck curator to kind of think of you as a totally dispensable thing that can be replaced with somebody else because there's so many people who are working similar to that and, and all that stuff. Yeah, but that's that's what that's the thing. Maybe that's the the way of, of doing that is becoming the curator of yourself and kind of like using the magnetization of your own taste to kind of input, like overwhelm other curators that are going to curate your art. You know, um, I so agree with you. I just wasn't wasn't sure if Paige agrees with you or not. And but but I mean this kind of content. I mean the KPM Lit Music Library, for example, they become really rare nowadays. People seek them because other curators have kind of awarded value to it. It became a sort of fetish. So the the fact that people are curating it kind of like awarded a new artistic value to it. So these are actually very expensive now. That if you search for for them, yeah, you always have and, this and to, cover. And to move from this to the next paradigm, thirty years later, all those or the best of those porn soundtracks were all released on vinyl and people loved the quality of the recording yeah. 
And I have some of that, but unfortunately those artists are dead or gone and they actually had no agency. And now some record company is trying to like reframe it as original great music that is beyond the catalog, right? Yeah, yeah, but maybe maybe let's go to the next one. Yeah, no, no, I was just gonna mention that like these stock images are also kind of like that, that like you provide these images like they're kind of robotically generated uh, and people curate them and put it into advertising or like pedagogy, like children's book and stuff like that. Uh, but it's kind of dangerous too, because there is a, an intentionality, like a, an ideological thing behind it. So like, this is what you get when you search for success in a Shutterstock image. You get these images of people like in suits and stuff, celebrating like their meetings and stuff like that. So like mountains and sort of imagery. There is like an imaginary that is imbued in this sort of stock images. So, like happiness is like, oh, you need to have a family, right? You need to be in this open like field. Yeah, maybe you need to have a dog. I'm not against that. <laughs> you do need to have that. Uh, so there's this like ideology that is imbued in it and that is like replicated by the advertisement, which is this is a very interesting thing. But like maybe in the future, we will have like a stock image that has all the virtual possible scenarios ever. And, you know, you don't all need to produce new images because all images will already be copyrighted by this sort of virtual catalog. And you just curate the images. So that's kind of like the long-term um, Kind of like second tendency, I guess. You and if just you just input some... it, or you just input it a text line in a in again, and it, it will yeah. be generated. It's it's the same thing, I guess. Of again, which is what I put here. But even in again, like text and things, some terms will come up with some obscure stuff, which is kind of interesting. How how like there's like this unconscious behind the machine, which is like sometimes like in GPT two, for example, this is a page called Boston New York that takes like the data set is basically humans of New York that page which is very uh, tacky. Uh, and it sort of becomes kind of diabolical sometimes because of a repetition or a lack in representation. It kind of becomes eerie or like, it kind of I becomes think, schizophrenic. I think we, sh we should explain what GP3 is because some people might not know, and especially those watching the video later might, might not know what GP3 is. I totally know, because we worked with GP3 two years ago for some projects we did with the LEM seminar and all that, but maybe you want to like bring it up. Like this actually, this is actually GPT-2, which is the older version, which is like more common, very common. GPT-3 is kind of like, they haven't really um, distributed like publicly yet because they are kind of afraid that like of the power it has because it actually can generate like extremely like, uh, you can like, it's, it, you put like one phrase um, from like a writer, like, I don't know, Moby Dick, and it will do the whole book like perfectly. So it kind of like, it, really confuses the situation of like creation. And, and I think if GPT-3 like is released, uh, we won't really have academia anymore maybe because you can just write all your papers on GPT-3 really easily. Uh, with Actually, no, do you like, know how you can use it right now? There are select people who have yeah, access yeah. to it. You propose yeah. to them what you want to do and then you send your words or phrases to them and then they see if it's qualified or not and then they run it through the GPT-3 and then they send it to you. That's how we yes, work. It's with like that. for research right now, right? Just yeah, research. totally. And it's and it's exactly it's exactly like that. Like if GP3 is released, it basically makes so much of the humanities writing redundant because the machines yeah. actually do a better job. And I don't I don't know how academia would deal with that. I mean, because how do you deal with that? How do you how do you grade a student who can write a a, a paper with a button? You know, how do you grade the grade system? We have to change the like idea of like intelligence. We have to change probably, right? Because how do you a word like what's pedagogy now because everyone yeah. can write any text yeah to to textual creativity it totally has a relationship with artificial insemination it had in the late 70s when first they first did it and there was so much resistance from church and naturally saying like this is too powerful humans shouldn't put male and female together in a lab and all that this is kind of like that people are really afraid of its power right but i just can't wait for when gp3 is actually released because i'm actually like looking forward to like better academic writing than what is coming out of like no seriously yeah, yeah. Did, you, we need... did you read did you read that thing that i mean there was this like uh there was this sentence released but uh, there was this like thing quoted by uh daniel Sassoletto, our own instructor few few uh oh i read it days, i read it, it just ago, buzzwords just, right yeah yeah it, it's it just, it just, this is what it said. This is like, this is not GP3. Like this is GP minus three written by a <laughs> scholar, right? It says, in terms of the globalization of the novel, the exceptionality of Antarctica 
its non-dialectical negative exteriority that can be read in its continuous resistance to claims of national sovereignty and capitalist exploitation highlights the hegemonic representation of the particularity of any sequence of aesthetic exchanges, appropriation, translations, and importations as a universality that grounds the totalizing horizon of the discourses of globalization. That means like, like <laughs> GP3 would have done a way better job if you just say, tell me something about why Antarctica is not like a nation state, right? It would have just done a better job of kind of like, because there's some good, good stuff in this sentence, right? That tries to tell you Antarctica is different than a nation with mm -hmm. a border, right? But it just gets covered with like really bad, bad like user language. Yeah, the mud of like academic discourse, right? And then again, I already talked a little bit about that. I'm gonna, gonna skip that. And oh, and, the, and then we get to the third like kind of paradigm that we're thinking about, which is we call it tech formalism, which is this idea that art becomes this sort of anti-screen, anti-everything that the lockdown represents, right? So anti the flattening of the digital, and it becomes this sort of particular embodiment of a situation. So like we go from this type of site-specific works to site-exclusive works, you know, works that can only uh, function in their proper place there and then. And like, you can't do this at home. You can't do this at, like through a screen. You have to be there to experience that and start this physical uh, installation, right? So it's a specific physical installation. Uh, and now only the interface kind of the museum matters, the context uh, more matters more than the act. Um, and this is kind of like overcoming what uh, uh, people call form cinema and like film studies, which is this idea that like, like we basically people have been going to the, to the same installation like every weekend to see different content, right? Which is cinema. Cinema is one installation where you go to this black space dark room, silent, you have the chairs, you have the screen, like uh, square screen, right? Rectangle screen, you have the light, you have this kind of noise of the machine beeping behind you. This is the same installation every time, it's just the content that's changing. And um, I think video art in the 90s uh, in art is already a type of like trying to create a variety of cinemas in relation to the way of experiencing audiovisual, right? So kind of installation, audiovisual installation is like that. But attack formalism is basically like artists cannot create anymore without an engineer. You can only create if you have your own mathematician to calculate what's going on for you. Because either or, or you become the engineer, right? Either you become the engineer or you have an engineer that's hired to, to make the artworks. Um, and like taking to the, to the extreme, this is like the, like this is a return to the panorama, right? The, the early forms of cinema that were like this giant, like, ambiences, right? You get in into it. And this is like a painting. This is a panorama. Um, but it's I just also to, like, uh, give a historical historical reference here. For me, you know, this type of tech formalism, uh, and I, I share this with an art historian who actually did a seminar for us a few years ago, Samuel Sakharov, who is a, now a curator at the, at the New York Jewish Museum, which is like, you know, having missed what Europe kind of like went through in terms of industrialization and how industrialization came to America very fast and rapidly in the late 19th, early 20th century. A lot of American painters were fascinated with the surface of the in industrial, industrial life in America, right? One of the best examples of it is Stuart Davis. I don't know who, when, who, how many of you know Stuart Davis, fascinating American painter. His work was considered kitsch by people who created MoMA, so they censored him. They never had him in MoMA. Uh, what's his name? Um, the other museum in New York, not Guggenheim, but like the other one that sort of like moved downtown to the High Line. Oh, the names of New York just... Whitney, 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 oh, okay. Whitney bought a lot of Stuart Davis, right? And, and you see this type of like celebration of like the surfaces of the industry and technology in early 20th century in this group of painters work. They painted very realistic and very shiny almost very technical to, to make these paintings happen. You had to have like extreme technique to replicate these like surfaces of like, you know what I mean? Cities with like factories or like, uh, or like uh, manufactured objects. They're, they're almost like a reminiscent of pop art because they were really like uh, fascinated with like covers of like soap bars or like salt shakers and stuff that the factories are putting up for mass consumption. And I think this type of tech formalism has one of its roots in this 
uh, 20th century American art that now finally is being recognized. And then there's many shows and MoMA's including them in the permanent collection. And they're trying to say, yeah, this also existed in America. But yeah, but also this type of panorama, we were actually trying to include an artist who does these large panoramas in Europe in, in our guests, but they were too busy and they couldn't, they couldn't accept our uh, invitation. So yeah, so like this tech formalism that, that we, we identified, so like became one of the one of the things that people went to see after after pandemic was over. One example of it was that uh, New York one called Van Gogh in something, right? Yeah, immersive Catherine, Van Gogh. You, no, no. The immersive Van Gogh, right? Yeah, yeah. But but better examples of it that basically like is more illustrative of what what uh, Romola was saying was this show called Dark Matter in Berlin, which is actually a permanent exhibition now which basically is sort of like a algorithmically produced movement with like this type of minimalist light shows in rooms that are like, uh, they play like a customized and generative electronic music, mostly ambient, right? And like, I went to see this show with a friend and then we realized that everybody else but us was on ketamine or on MDMA. And I was just like, we should have done some drugs too because this work really requires that, right? So, so like it was like the first time that you would do those drugs not with your friend in your living room because you were locked up, but it was very much like again you were in a very dark, secluded space, lying down on these like kind of like beautiful things, and these 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 pieces would come down, up and down and move to the rhythm of the music and a type of like tech, spec tech spectacle minimalism formalism, all this stuff blended in, right? If you go to the next slide, I'll explain a little bit more of, of, the, of, of shows. Of course, you see the relation with industry. This is like the latest show of Robert Irwin that in a space called Light Art Space in Berlin, right? Which basically is the old Trezor nightclub, a factory turned nightclub and now turned into what is called uh, Craftwork Berlin that showed this work. This is sort of like a hybrid where like an art, well-known American artist from 1970s belonging to the, to the light and light and space movement. So like it's brought in to kind of create similar kind of situation where like you have this like work that can only be produced in a large industrial space with the help of engineers. Maybe go to the next slide. Yeah, and, and I think this is kind of a return to the invention fair, you know, the art fair becomes the invention fair, you go to see these machines, these inventions, it's not like a creation, like artistic creation anymore, it's more like a techno scientific exploration or discovery, you know, and you don't go for the really conceptual part, you go more for the sensible impact, it's like this heavy. But it's, um, but it's aestheticization of that, it's sort of like yes. a, form, it's a form of formalism, it's not of really course. invention, it's sort of like it incorporates invention to create some sort of like flat and superficial sort of like- What you mean is that the, the invention itself is like a, like a form of art, right? The conceptual, yeah. Totally. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And I think this, like a hint to that happens in like Marvel movies and like action movies of today, which are like this sort of pornography for the senses is like nothing morally wrong with that. I'm not like criticizing that. I think there's great like value in like violence as a sort of aesthetics. Um, but it's just different from that romantic view of art, you know, this trend of like sensorial violation and like that creeps into art and like art fairs becomes this sort of amusement parks, uh, like with this giant like site specific toys that you get, get, get in line to enter, you know, it's like the, the lines of like art fairs really remind me of like the lines in amusement parks It's the same thing. Um, and this is like a old like um, uh, invention fair, which they put this Mario Rama, which is like a mu amusement park toy right now, right? Uh, which is this boat that they took into the fair and like presented this sort of cinema. This is a roll of painting that like rolls together and it, it, it makes you pretend like you're in like port city, like New York or something like that, Amsterdam. And they made like a uh, wind and uh, wind and they put alga to, alga to like create the smell and stuff like that. This is the sort of experience that like happened in an invention fair, which is this is very similar to what's happening in like art right now, sort of creating different sort of experiences, uh, bodily experiences, right? Um, yeah, and uh, I think underlying this notion is the idea that life itself, like common routine life, is suddenly free to become this sort of cinema, this sort of contemplation. And the art of the museum is like this different thing, which is this erotic thing, you know, this impactful physical thing. So, 
do we do we skip the the Sun Machine and the Kusoma show, or they're coming up? No, they're coming up. They're coming up. They're because coming now up. we're in Gwangju Biennale. So, oh, but you moved yeah. that up for a reason, right? Okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to talk about Gwangju now? The... No, I think we no, I think we should we should do the Sun Machine and we should do the Kusoma because we're in that territory, right? And then we should come back to to the yeah there. Okay. So, so another show, another post pandemic show was this, this show put together by uh, this institution called Berliner Fischbühle, which was called The Sun Machine is Coming Down. And I saw this as sort of like a, a contemporary art establishment respond to tech formalism. So let's say like, oh my God, people want spectacle, what should we do, right? So this building, which is a 1979 building called the International Congress Center or ICC, great building, uh, fi finally finished in 1979. It closed for demolition, sadly. It was utilized for the exhibition of just normative contemporary art by names that you, you know, and I'm not going to mention the name. You know, if you can go to the next slide, it will be lovely. Yeah, so basically what they did was they tried to use the setting of the building and the fact that for many years, Berliners were not allowed to go to this building to kind of generate an interest and say, hey, we can do that tech formalism too. But the tech formalist part of it came from the architecture and the kind of innovative lighting they put on it, right? As you can see. And, but, but, but the effect of, effect of that was really bad for the art and the artists because they made the, those art look even less significant than they normally would be in a, in, a, in, a, in a white gallery. How can you compete with this setting? Like the building totally looks like a spaceship. And you were just going by these like tiny little things hanging around you and you're like oh oh i guess i'm here to see this art but actually and everyone was just busy doing their normal selfies and all that and taking pictures of this fantastic multi-story spaceship looking building right but yeah so so this is so like and then also of course maybe the next slide kusama uh, well, I don't think we have Kusama actually. Oh yeah, that's okay because because you know what I mean. The retrospective of Kusama that's been traveling around is also a way of still like saying like we have big, large, experiential spectacles too. But if you want to, if you want to, uh, yeah, you you've seen those experiential ones like this, yeah, like those ones, yeah, like big ones, yeah, like that room, yeah, that, that's actually the from mirror. the Berlin show, yeah, totally, yeah. These mirror rooms are like Gropius House in Berlin, like stage three of these mirror rooms and like they were like packed and they generated a lot of public, but it was it was almost like the art world version of the dark matter show. Just and this is very like art. Instagrammable, right? This is like for Instagram. You go there, take a picture, you post on Instagram. That's it's Instagrammable, but it's also very experiential. So you really yes, like I reading. actually think it's very good. <laughs> but, I like I mean, it too. I like it too. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. I also like I also like a lot of this like flat tech formal stuff. I totally yeah. I just wish I did drugs. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next, um, uh, okay, and the Biennales too, right? You want to talk about that? Because yeah, totally. You... Let's talk about let's talk about these two Biennales. I can I can talk, or or you can you can maybe begin and then I continue on. Yeah, how the like the pandemic and the pandemic, these big shows, like they were kind of empty and like what represented the shows were the critique. Basically, of them. post pandemic Biennale. What do you do in a Biennale after the pandemic? And we picked these two examples. One of them was the Guangzhou Biennale, both of them 2021, Guangzhou Biennale, and that took place finally a year later in Guangzhou, curated by a board member, Defne Ayes, and Natasha Jinwala, who's actually a curator at Gropius Baus in Berlin. And, and Daphne is really a guest. Had... Daphne is a guest for like the session. Yeah, Daphne is a guest. They, they really had a problem because what happened was they had managed to convince the city to make an exception for the Biennale. So people can attend it, but then uh, karaoke bars and casinos and all that went to government and said museums are entertainment places in the in the category of tax and all that, and you cannot let the museum open when karaoke bars and and gambling places are closed. So then the government was forced to say, sorry, you can't have people. So imagine you have a biennale, but nobody can come see it, right? So what, what, what they cleverly did was they realized that the only way they can actually have a Biennale is to get major press for it. So they worked really hard. They, they shifted some of the money and they brought somebody from New York Times, placed them in a great hotel, gave them a lot of like per diem to cover the show. And what came out of it was like this magnificent multi-page story in New York Times about 
how do you stage a global art show now? Well, you stage it in New York Times. That's what you stage it because mm -hmm. there was no other way to stage it. And it got a lot of positive reviews. And basically we all felt like we saw the show because if you can go to the slide, the article provided really convincing photographs of installations that really made you feel like you were there, right? Full page graphics, right? Really successful, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other example of it was this really important Biennale that takes place in, in Russia. It's the most important Biennale in Russia. It's called Ural Biennale that takes place in Katharinaburg. And this was also done where people affiliated with New Center. We did public program and a project with, with Misal Adnan, who actually taught a curatorial course for us in 2020, Charla Ilk, and actually the fellow you see, Asaf Kimmel, he's like the architect and the main guy that works both for, uh, what is that label? I forgot, the, the, the most important fashion label right now. Balenciaga? Balenciaga, he does all the like Balenciaga shows, like set up and also he does all of uh, that German artist that represented Germany in, 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 in Venice a few years ago, the female artist that does like the club kids aesthetics. Yeah, he mm. also works with them. So three of them teamed up as a curatorial team. But unfortunately being stuck in Russia and not being able to fly journalists or anything, the Biennale was good, but it almost didn't happen because we even had a hard time showing the pictures of the Biennale, you know, to, to see how it was because nobody saw it. It happened, it opened right in the, the situation was so bad that I was actually in Russia and I could review it for them. And I could actually try to put some press around about it. But they basically said, no, you cannot stay because your visa is over. We can't give you another visa because uh, Delta is going up in Russia. And basically they, they almost kicked me out of the country. And yeah, so basically you really have to think about these closed, closing downs and opening ups and how your schedule works and how you actually want to stage the shows because there's no yeah, guarantee so that by the time you open, you're going to get a crowd. Go ahead. Uh, some, something that happened in Rio was like uh, an exhibition went out Anna without That's right. That's right. That's right. Anna M. Went, Sorry. Uh, an exhibition went out without expectations and just the sponsors saw it. The sponsors uh, kind of paid for it. The exhibition happened and then they, they started like researching for it. The exhibitions and then the pandemic hit. Then they did the exhibition either way because they already had the money from the sponsors, but no one saw it, just the sponsors, which is kind of an interesting thing, I think, which is art without expectators, which is maybe like also it could be a tendency, which I think is kind of comfy actually. Um, and I put like a Brancusi studio here because Brancusi said like that his studio was the artwork in itself, like you can't experience that outside of the studio uh, because of the light condition and the, the relation between the sculptures they have this situation. So the only people that can see the artwork technically are the people that go into the studio. Um, this is like a page that takes out picture of people uh, on, on Google Street View, which is also an interesting type of art form, which is like people become objects of the art without knowing. Um, so I think that this sort of exhibition without uh, expectators is another alternative to But the fourth tendency that we wanted to mention was um, the actual technologization of meaning, right? And like technologization of authenticity and like uh, which is what NFT and blockchains kind of represent, which is trying to create truth for art via technology. Like blockchain is an enforcement of this metaphysical truth by technology. Like it's like the Lendian kind of view that Bitcoin is like the Kantian kind of end game, you know? And NFT is kind of like the patrimonialization of art's meaning. Uh, like neither the content nor the form they matter anymore. It's just this kind of ownership, you know, full fetishization of consumption, full separation of object and like the desire and to the have price. it. And, the price, and price. Is the most important. yeah, exactly. And it's like a tribal sign. You, you, you belong to this community. There's just a, it's a tribal sign for displaying distinction and for converging to a sense of belonging with your group. Yeah, it's uh, price. Re price replaces both form and content, and it's really exactly. like no one cares about the meaning or or what does it look like as long as it's under hundred megabytes, so it can become a NFT. It, and it's all about the price, and you see it with anxiety that produces, right? So you have like a Great artists like John Gerard that we're actually trying to get as a guest of the last session. He does an NFT. His works are worth $5 million, but NFT, he's an NFT tank. So it's like, oh my God, I can't, I can't reproduce the same success in NFT. And then you have like, like people with no like track record in the art world selling stuff that is worth like millions of dollars. And, and immediately that number gives them a place in the bigger art world. 
and future possibility of inclusion in biennales and other shows just because they were able to produce $67 million for a crappy little art. Yeah, I think there's two, maybe two problems that I would criticize the NFTs for. First is like how these people have no sense of like aesthetic sensibility, but like maybe that already happened in the art world. Like collectors also have no aesthetic sensibility and they need marchands and you need critics to like kind of like tell them what you buy, you know? So maybe we need some sort of critical environment for NFTs. And the other problem would be the environmental damage, which I mean, everyone talks about it, but I don't know if that's, I mean, I know that blockchain has a lot of impact, but I don't know if the NFTs compared to the blockchain have a lot of like, I don't know if percentage wise is really impactful. I think the art market's like smaller than it seems very small. Um, and I think also this problem kind of is solved, can be solved by proof of stake, um, uh, which we, we probably have in a couple of years. Um, I don't think it's gonna take that long. It's very true for you because the problem with uh, environmental damage is of course that every transaction needs to be like proof by like the actual energy of the machines, right? Uh, but that, that are hashing the codes. Um, but if you have proof of take, that, that's like zero impact. Um, so maybe we need to like, uh, people are very like kind of like dismissive of NFTs in the art world, I think right now, um, and especially in leftist circles, but uh, I don't know if they're really get, grappling with like how this, the potential of it, you know, if you take away the like this environmental problem, if you take away the people with no aesthetic sensibility that have been going into the circles, uh, it's actually a pretty interesting technology. Um, and so that's kind of it, right? Well, we have like, we have, don't have much time. I mean, I, I was gonna mention this art, art view of art that, that art for people have that like, is this optimistic view of the museum becoming again, this sort of space for creating the future. Um, but I think like, personally, I think um, this would require like a, first a lot of money from people to actually put into research for the implementation of this kind of high precision visions. Uh, and second, like a lot of open-mindedness from rich people that I don't think we have right now. And third, like a total lack of hope in relation to any other sort of established systems capacity to deal with the world crisis, right? Like if we have any other option uh, other than giving artists money, we're going for that because people don't trust arts, like rich people um, to like build the future, right? This is a very like response, like it's a lot of responsibility. Um, so I don't know if this is like kind of, kind of like optimistic view of like art, uh, actually having this pragmatic like operational function uh, really like will play out. Um, yeah, and, and there's another yet more pessimistic view, which is uh, artwork becoming kind of like this space for like this cultural war, right? Is an accessory for this everlasting cultural war, which is art becoming this kind of pedagogical tool uh, in a space of conflict, uh, a conflict for hegemony and for voice uh, and for owning the public discourse. So kind of like art becoming this kind of space where people battle like wokeism, right? Who's more woke? Who, who has the ownership of the public word? Um, which I think is also very shaped by grant-based kind of a ontology, kind of like it's shaped by how people can get funding to stuff, you know? This, this the image way people talk about art. Maybe we should explain the image where it comes from. And this is sort of like the plan of the curators for the next documenta. I heavily criticize it on Facebook. And this art historian also wrote a piece that we translated and published it on Triple Ampersand with Romola, which got a lot of clicks and likes. And actually, people who are staff at Documenta, they contacted us and thanked us for doing this because they also there's a lot of resistance in the institution against it because what they see is the complete erasure of art and artists and takeover of this sort of like art as a rhetorical tool in culture wars. And they really, I mean, these people are not necessarily like right wing, but they just think like what this group of curators are doing to document it completely. Yeah, totally, totally. The coffee shop, yeah, you read the text. Yeah, so, so that basically the idea of an exhibition is like this rice barn where people gather and like, like very much like, and then the writer kind of like compared it to like the barn coffee shop in Berlin. And then they compare the text that the barn coffee shop uses to promote the coffee and the text that the, the curators use. And it was, they were almost interchangeable. The way they talk about art and the way they talk about coffee is all about authenticity and like space of your own and blah, blah, blah. And then what happened was uh, another aspect of this rhetoric, rhetorical like form is that the whole cancer culture in the art world. If you want to go to the slide about like, yeah, so this is the works of John Raffman, Canadian artist kind of like categorized under uh, post-internet. John was canceled in the summer of 2020, right? In the beginning of the post-pandemic era. 
he had a major retrospective coming up in a German museum. And then three women claimed that he was sexually inappropriate with them. And they, they very creatively and cleverly, they, they knew that Twitter is not enough. So they made a very stylized white type on black, uh, no, black type on white background. And they kind of like put the personal accounts of what they thought happened on it. And somehow because of Instagram, the story went viral and then the museums around the world started, started canceling, canceling John's shows and galleries dropped him and he basically became like a persona non grata in the art world. And uh, another example, but, 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 but when I was in Rome last, I saw that uh, the, the, the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Rome had done a film showing of John. So we went to it, John wasn't there. And I spoke with the museum director and then he basically said that like, he's trying to uncancel him by bringing him back and saying like, regardless of like, whatever, these, these things were never proven in court, John needs to be considered as an artist. And he said that he's giving him a solo show. So, and then the, the other incident that happened was like following up the rice barn, there's this controversy that's cooking up right now. And if you don't hear about it, it's because the artist is not white. And the artist is from Taiwan. And basically after his name was released as one of the artists in the next documenta, and also he was announced as the artist that will represent Taiwan in the upcoming Venice Biennale, Basically, there's a, there was a campaign launched by a single artist, single female artist, that he was sexu he sexually abused, sexually abused her or sexually inappropriated with her or something like that. And then basically, uh, of course, a political show like Documento needs to be careful about what it's doing, right? So what happened was uh, the curators of Documento were kind of forced to make a statement about it prior to saying that they're gonna cancel him or not. So they basically said that like, there's an investigation, we're gonna take these allegations seriously and we will let you know as soon as possible if he will be included in the show or not. But also this has completely uh, like put it at risk, his participation to represent the country. And the interesting thing is that he's Aboriginal. So he's, his response to this has been sort of like a charge of racism saying like, oh, if this was a Taiwanese artist, this would have never happened. This is happening to me because I'm a poor Aboriginal male artist that is easily like categorized as a bad guy. So it's like almost like a culture wall within the work world, like saying like one is accusing the other one of racism. The other one is saying like, no, you're actually sexually inappropriate and we have to investigate it. So this is cooking and we still don't know because the investigation basically taking too long because it's been 10 days and there has not been a new statement from Documenta about what happens, what happens with this artist. But what I thought about when John's story happened, I thought about like, uh, how do you like, I mean, this is public money. Public money has gone into basically preparing this artist to represent the country in the Biennale, right? So what are the ways to, to mediate that? And I thought the best way to do it is like, is like basically before you pick an artist, you really need to do a background check. And, of course, the background check is better done by algorithms. So instead of like board members and curators trying to influence the background check, you, you, you like for big solo shows in big museums, for representation in like uh, biennales, you really need to basically, the artists need to submit their text messages. And I'm not being sarcastic. Text messages, Facebook posts, emails to the in-person algorithm. And then algorithm will say, this artist will have a 65% chance of being canceled in the next six months based on this like history, right? So then public money is not invested in, in this artist because right now, if he gets canceled from Taiwan, the whole installation that's in process, all of that has to be thrown out and more public money has to be spent on quickly replacing him with another artist. And I really don't want, I mean, I don't have any problem with my life being looked at, and then the risk of me being canceled is, is assessed, but I'd rather see a machine in charge of that. But, right? but that's interesting because then curators become this sort of legal apparatus, right? This yeah, sort of law. I mean. Thanks for bringing it up. I don't want another responsibility for curator as the judicial authority on who should or should not get canceled. And the statement irritated me, not because they investigate an artist. Of course, a political show like Documenta, 
needs to know what where the policy, personal politics of each artist is. But the fact that they put it upon themselves to say, we are going to investigate and we are going to decide. Like, it's a new responsibility of a curator is to sort of like decide if you're going to get canceled or not. And I'd much rather see that in the hand of a, like an arm's length third party. You know what I mean? Somebody who doesn't have a stake in art and the best would be an algorithm, right? Give me all the text messages and just from the tone of the artist, I can tell you this artist is problematic. And he, sooner or later, he's going to become a hot potato for our institution. So you know what, like, because the, the documenta statement is really, they become in, like investigators, right? Legal investigators, moral investigators, like the art doesn't matter anymore. We are curators, we need to investigate this person's life in order to see if it's like compatible with our like values, right? It's kind of a weird position for a curator to be in, which is, they are right now, right? Everyone kind of is. Um, the, algor the algorithm can also determine the length of cancellation because we all know Louis C.K. is back, right? A lot of canceled people are coming back, but in different lengths, right? According to like many different elements will determine for how long you cancel. John Rathman's already back in Rome, so I can see if he gets that solo show, soon he's going to get other shows, and then basically the whole controversy will be rolled over and he'll be accepted back into the art world, right? So maybe algorithm can also say, yes, Mohammed will be canceled in six months, but don't worry, in five months, he'll be back again. So by the time the show opens, it'll be fine, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, I think the last, uh, uh, we, we're already like 4.30. I don't know if people want to, if people want to leave, I think it's all right, right? But we can go on, right? We, we still want to talk about the, the dates, the sessions it's themselves a little bit, right, Mo? Mm, I think maybe we should just share with everyone the bios okay. and, and, and all that. Okay, and I'll do like uh, I'll do like a new syllabus including all the bios and a, a little bit of a comment on the themes of the sessions and you can go you know, ask you know, let's just before we get into technicalities, let's see if anybody has anything to say because I see like lots of, lots of interesting comments on the sidebar. I wasn't semi facetious, man. I'm just really saying like, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if, if if cancellation and process of like choosing through elimination is part of the art world, I want to see that properly institutionalized, properly done, and then accept it. It's like, yes, some artists are horrible criminals that have hidden do you think the, the past. But do you think the algorithms will be good enough for that? Because they, I think they, they can just like implement new um, problems with the, if the algorithms are not good enough, right? Can they implement new errors? I certainly don't want museum board members and curators who have an interest to be in charge of that. So I think it's less corrupt than that. I see Georgina's hand up. Yeah. I think, um, sorry, I was trying to search quickly, but someone, maybe someone can help me. I think Oxford or Harvard came with these like um, software that can measure bias in a person. So you take this test and then, um, they can assess if you have intrinsic va uh, bias in you and like also what kind of race you are based on what mm -hmm. you um, answered. Yes, uh, but the, the software like raised a lot of concern in, in like um, it, it also, of course, it didn't uh, always guess the race of the, the person who took the test and uh, the person might not be honest when they take the test. Sure. Um, and also, what, what's the what's the reason for like finding out a race, someone's race? What's the point of doing that exactly? So it's measured bias, and also sometimes you know like who's biased against whom. You know, like mm, kind okay. of because uh, uh, okay. there are like of course um, there's a um, let's say. <laughs> The, there's there's also an ethnic component like some ethnicities really hate one another and you know they, um, they had these all yeah they tried to measure that it's very difficult and it's very technical and they put all these manuals in which they explain what they did but it came with a lot of uh, it was not met very uh, yeah enthusiastically yeah I, I can imagine that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah it's, it's something that quite hard because then I, I yeah. don't see that maybe in the future Mohammed 
Um, yeah, I think in the future where the algorithm is more advanced than what we have right now, I think that makes a lot of sense actually. But the problem is, I don't know, maybe you just reinstate some prejudices. Probably. Just if, if we, you oh, know, yeah, the, interesting, we... the, inter the interesting thing is the way John, and, and I spoke with the director of the Contemporary Art Museum in, in, in Rome, right? The way he kind of exonerated himself was actually by submitting his text messages with these women, by submitting all, all his emails and say like, look and see how did this relationship develop? Okay, I was a little bit of a sex addict. And I slept with a lot of women, unfortunately, in that period of time. But here's all my text messages. Look and see, you see anything. And then somehow it was decided that like, oh, actually this is too complex for it to be black and white like this, blah, 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 right? So, and, and funny thing is I thought about the submission of text messages way before I heard that he was submitting text messages. So like, I remember- like absolute I about, transparency, right? Absolute yeah, it's transparency. Like, here it is, take a look. And you know what I mean? Basically, basically he told me that like in every instance, the women had pursued him several times and him saying like, oh, I'm busy, I can't meet you. But then they had pursued him one more time. Hey, are you back in town from the installation? Can we hang out? So then that was one way that it was like proven that it was more complex than that. And, and basically the content of text message is how this was kind of like decided on a favor. But again, who made the final decision? is an institution that has a stake in bringing him back, right? So I'm sure the director and the museum has an interest in seeing John back in the, in the circle, right? That's true. And I think it really like, uh, uh, George, uh, Georgina's point was that it's kind of this token, but I think the this token part is actually kind of the, the transparency. But if you think that private life is kind of over already, or like in like 50 years, we won't have a private life anymore, which is a tendency, I guess. Uh, that's not this topic at all. Having the algorithm judge that because then you are actually saving the the kind of like human kind of like conflict, right? You just put in the transparency into the algorithm and it solves for you. Kind of like I have no such concerns or belief in private life. <laughs> yeah, I think private life is kind of like tendentially. So, so, so what what were you gonna do, Mala? You said you want to do a short bio or something like that, or no, and I think I'm just gonna. Uh, I think this is the uh, last slide. It's kind of like a. Let's about... just talk about no, but we should talk about what we need for next week. For the the the, 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 oh, the yes. structure of the assignment we need to talk about, right? So why don't you do that and I fill in the, the gaps? And we should also email this for those who had to leave right at the mark at three thirty because some people might miss what's expected of them. Of course, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna have like this. The assignment won't be like a final assignment at the end of it all. We're gonna do like like Jason does. Because some people are. Uh, familiarized with that, which is like small weekly tasks. So this week, the tasks basically want you to make two lists. Uh, it's actually six lists, but it's like what's in and what's out. You know, that's mean, that mean kind of like in and out of the year. Uh, you need to do that for the year, for the decade and for the century. What do you think is in yeah. and what do you think it's out? So, what do you so think is like saturated? Three what's and three out. Exactly. For the year, the decade, the, the year, the, the what was it that they the year year the decade, decade and century and the century in yeah. and the year the decade and the century out so basically yeah. six six short paragraphs maximum 500 600 words or minimum 400 words for next week as long as like we're interested in more of the content and then for every week depending on the topic of the week we will be having these short assignments and then hopefully we're the idea is to connect them together, edit them, and actually publish them as a real book, not just a PDF, but a real new sensor book. So if we all work nicely on our individual text, uh, with the help of Romara, who's doing the editing for, for Ampersand, and my help, we will somehow put this together. And also, and also we're sending you, I, I asked you to download a file here, because this is sort of like a something I, something I performed once for an institution in Berlin in 2018. It's called Artwork 3000. And I thought, I'm gonna share it with you because a lot of the ideas of like the future of art is in this short sci-fi I wrote. It's a funny story and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope it's inspiring for some of these texts that you will be writing for the next session because we are gonna be using a lot of like speculation and science fiction type of stuff for the future assignment of the next six, seven weeks that we're together. So I thought this is a great text to kind of like have. You don't have to read it. It's not required reading. And, but and so basically, like, 
It's the yeah, first time it's being shared. So please don't share it with anyone because I want to work on it and maybe publish it with somebody later. So yeah, so it's unpublished and it's, uh, it's suggests it's just for your own, uh, for your own fun and interest and inspiration maybe, or maybe what not to do. Yeah, so uh, Zenobio was asking about the amount of words. This is like just half a page to one page each tasks, right? So each week you have like this different task that will be like half to one page kind of size. And then at the end of the, the, the two months, you have you put this all together and you have this kind of coherent kind of uh, little uh, amount of collection of tasks, tasks, tasks. And then um, at the you end of it, all put, together. put them all together. All, every student has, has its own and you put them all together and you make this sort of book, right? This is the idea. Uh, and also we have the presentations. We already have, I'll send you guys like a spreadsheet for the presentations. I'll send you the text we have for next week. Next week, we are having Julia Friedman and Julieta Aranda, uh, which are, it's, it's a uh, top, the topic would be art criticism and the discourses around art. And I'll send you guys the PDFs. I'll send you the spreadsheet with the presentations so that you guys start putting your names there. Uh, we start dividing the presentations. We already have presentations for the next class if someone wants to like volunteer, okay? Um, and that's it, right, Mo? Anything else yeah. you want to mention? Yes, no, uh, let's see if anybody has any questions. No. It was great. It was a great talking okay. to you guys. Great yes, session. Great. Yes. And uh, yeah, see you guys next week, okay? See you next week. Alberto, we should hang out when I'm back in Berlin. For sure, we could get some, some K and go to see the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs>